From London, we present a play for radio by Max Marquis. Dead Drop. Did you hear anything? Like what? I don't know. A collision, something like that. No, Jim. You know, Hampstead Heath really is marvellous. We could be miles from town, right in the country, instead of, what, about three miles from Euston. Hmm. I think I'll have to move up to Hampstead one day. A bit expensive. It depends. Yes, I suppose you're right. Unless we both... There's no chance of that. No. Well, not for a while, anyway. What's that? Look, there's someone lying by the roadside. Oh, it's, it's probably a drunk or a tramp. We, we don't want to. Oh, we get can't it. just leave him there. He'll be all right when he stepped it off. Well, Harold, stop! We've got to go back well, and have a. It's not up to us. Harold. Oh, well. I'll go. You stay in the car. I'll come with you. I'd rather you didn't. He's very still. Harold, his eyes are open. June, keep away. He's dead. What? How? I, I don't know. Heart attack, I suppose. Isn't that blood on the road? N no, oil. It's these yellow lights, they make things look different. Well, come on, back to the car. But He's can't... dead now, come on. But, Harold, you're come on. my arm. Then hurry up. God. I told you to stay here. I'll try to forget it. I'll, I'll give you a drink in a minute. We've got to report but it. We don't Harold. want to get involved. Look, but we have Look, to. Look, the pair of us out together at this time of night. We've only been for, for a drink. drink. Probably get our names in the papers, policemen calling at us at work, inquest. But we've got to do something. Why? But somebody might have killed him. Oh, come on. Look, there's a phone box. I'll call the police anonymously and tell them what we saw. How's that? Well, uh, well what more can we tell them than what we saw? All right, but, but I'll phone. Well, if you like. But no names, though. No. Distribution? Harold, it's me. I have to see you now. Uh, I'm afraid we're rather busy at the moment. Can I call you back? No, it's important. Well, I'll see. It can't wait. Very well. I'll come along now. Where is it to be picked up, please? I'll meet you at uh, Westminster Underground Station. Say ten minutes. Fifteen at the outside. Now, look, June. What's all this about? I had to spin a yarn to my chief about a file going Read missing. Read that. Have you got me out just to... Read it. <sighs> Hampstead Police, answering a 999 call made late last night by an, an anonymous woman reporting a dead man by the roadside at the Heath. Found no trace of a body. A search was carried out and resumed at first light this morning without success. It was either a hoax or a drunk who got up and walked away, a local police spokesman said. But there was a body there. They couldn't have missed it. Oh, wait a minute. Perhaps it was a drunk, after all. It, uh, it could even have been... You said yourself he was dead. Well, keep the voice down. Look, we can't talk here. Let's, let's go onto the bridge. We've got to do something. June, let's think for a moment. If it would have caused trouble to report it and give our names last night, how much more of a mess would it be now? I don't see oh, that. <sighs> Look, you're pretty, but sometimes you're not very bright for your grade. Two civil servants out for a night's boozing at the Spaniards, followed by a bit of you-know-what in the bushes. Well, we didn't. Yeah, don't I know it? Oh, be serious. I am. No, really, that's how it'll look. But we... Wait. There's Sybil. If she suspects I might want a divorce, that I've got someone... Well, that I love. Darling. Well, she'll hang on forever just to be a bitch. I don't know. There was a dead man there. I thought he was he dead. He was. What happened to him? 
We've got to report it, give them full details. Why? No, listen. What more can we tell them than we've told them already? What good would it do? At least they'll know. Will they? I'm not so sure. And let's face it, we did have a few drinks. I wouldn't have fancied my chances with the breathalyzer. I could have been wrong. It looks as if I was. Now, let's forget it, darling. It can't do any good. And it might do us... Our chances, a lot of harm. Mm. Forget it. You won't go to the police. All right. Promise? Promise. I'm Inspector McAndrew, CID. The desk sergeant says you claim you saw a dead body in Windmill Lane last night. That's right. I made the 999 call. Yes, I've, uh, I've got the report. We uh, didn't find any dead bodies. There was one. Then I wonder what happened to it. I don't know, but he was dead. <sighs> Look, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Corney, you'd be surprised how many dead bodies on the heath we get reported. But when we get there, they're either drunk or just plain shagged out, if you see what I mean. This one was dead. He was lying there with his eyes open. Very well. Let's start from the beginning. What time was this? 11.15, 11.20. Were you on foot? Driving? Driving. Towards town. I'd been to meet a friend for a drink at the Spaniards. Were you alone? Yes. Are you sure? Of course. Well, you saw this uh, body by the roadside. Yes. Well, there was this man lying there, one arm sort of half under his head. His eyes were open. He was dead. How did you know? You could tell. So I, I, I drove onto a phone box and dialed 999. But you didn't wait? No. Why? I didn't want to get involved. Statements, inquest, all that. But you are involved. You've, uh, you've come back all the way from um, SW15. Why? I had to. I read in the paper about your not finding the body. I, I realised there was something wrong. How long had he been dead? I don't know. Oh, was he warm, cold, stiff? I didn't touch him. Because you could see he was dead. You didn't need to feel for a pulse or anything. No. He had his arm half under his head. Yes. As though he was sleeping. Well? He wasn't asleep. Can you describe him? Oh, it was all rather... Well, you know, he, he was... What a medium sort of man. I didn't look all that closely. No. I don't suppose you did. What's that supposed to mean, Inspector? Just agreeing with you, miss. Well, thank you very much. You've been most helpful. Come in. Hello, Petra. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Hart. Oh, Mr. Coleman won't be a moment. Mm, I like that suit. Thank you. Uh, what have you been doing while I was away? Oh, nothing. It's been very dull. I'm ready, Petra. Very good, Mr. Coleman. You can go in now. On my hands and knees, or may I walk this time? <laughs> Oh, hello, Hart. That Cambridge business all finished now? Huh? One dead, two arrested, and one recalled. Yes, I'd say it was finished. Fancy being sent to Cambridge to spy. Here, have a look at this newspaper cutting, will you? Hampstead Police answering a 999 call. No, 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 no. Dead man by the roadside found no trace of a body. A hoax or a drunk who walked away. Well? You might go up there and find out if there's anything in it. In this? You're joking. Mm -hmm. No. No, of course not. Not you. Good afternoon. Do I make it official or shall I go to stores and draw a false beard? Official, but don't be heavy-handed about it. Better take Bellamy with you. Who was the copper up there? The officer who dealt with the matter is Inspector McAndrew. <coughs> um, yes, I'm Inspector McAndrew. What have we done to get your lot on our back? Oh, I don't know, really. Somebody reported a dead body by the roadside last night, but when you got there... You're not here about that, isn't it, Tarzan? <coughs> it, it, it was a drunk. Ah, you found him. No, it must have been. Couldn't it have been a hoax? No. How do you know? The informant came in and told us there was a body. Insisted. But you didn't find it? There wasn't any body. And I wonder why she thought there was. Hysterical? Frustrated? How should I know? Can I have her name and address? 
Miss June Coney, 19 Elm Court, the Terrace SW15. What was she like? 25, medium height, pleasant features, dark hair. Sensible? Well? She seemed so. Neither hysterical nor frustrated, then? Not when she came here, but I'm not a psychiatrist. And I wonder why she said there was a body. There was no body. No body. We had a whole squad of men searching all round the area. We didn't even find a dead rabbit. She saw a tramp having a snooze. Mm. And if your department has time to waste on this sort of thing, we haven't. So if there's nothing else... Just one more thing. Do you have a copy of your report with Miss Coney's statement in it? Be my guest. You've been most helpful. There's nothing in it. Believe me. I expect you're right. You're going to drop it, then? Uh, not quite. What, then? Reconstruction of the crime, in a manner of speaking. Having a look at the place where Miss Coney thought she saw a body. No, but it's dark. Well, it was dark when she saw whatever she saw. You people must have time to waste. And if you could have one of your men call my driver from the canteen? With pleasure. Sergeant Thomas, will you get the driver? Take it easy, Bellamy. It was around here somewhere. She was supposed to have seen a body. 300 yards past the bend, near a broken down public bench. Huh. Yes, this'll be it. Do you want me to come? Might as well. Lock the car, though. It'd be too embarrassing. What are we supposed to see in the dark? Good question. Lie down, will you? Sir? There, by the roadside. Well, I've got my good suit on. I'm flattered. I'll lend you a brush. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the light's good enough. These sodium lamps aren't very lovely, but they're effective. She would have been able to see you properly. How the devil did Coleman send me up here? Uh, all right to get up now? Hmm? Oh, yes. See that? There's a light through the trees there. Well, perhaps it's a lamppost on, on a pathway or something. No, I don't think so. Let's have a look. And don't step on any courting couples. Blimey! Rabbit. Oh, of course. Now, that's not a lamppost, but there's a road there, I think. It's... It's a house. Yeah, it's, it's a light in a house. Uh-huh. Big place, too. Funny. I didn't realise the road had bent so much. My sense of direction was all wrong. This must be... Yes, I thought I recognised it. You know it? Oh, yes, I know it. The most burglar-proof house in North London. It's got a front gate you couldn't drive a tank through and a big notice beside it. Soviet permanent cultural mission to the United oh, Kingdom. Fair. The good old <laughs> cultural KGB. KGB. And that's why Coleman sent me up here. I'll have two bets with you, Bellamy. Hmm? I bet there was a body, and I bet they know in there where it went. Good evening. Miss June Coney? Yes? My name is Hart, Ministry of Defence. Here's my authority. I see. May I come in, please? Do I have a choice? Thank you. Charming flat. I hope this isn't too terribly inconvenient. That depends how long you take. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, in here. Miss Coney, you reported finding a body by the roadside at Hampstead Heath the other night. Oh, not that. There was a body. The police talked me out of it for a while, but there was a body. Yes, I expect there was. What? I expect there was. Well, uh, would you like some coffee? If it's no trouble. It's already made. You live here alone? Yes. Pleasant for you. Now, the reason I asked, well, if you'll forgive me, I do know that Admiralty clerks, even your grade, aren't all that well paid. And this is rather a splendid place. Actually, I'm a controlled tenant. Well, that sounds very self-possessed. Pay a controlled rent. You know I work at the Admiralty, then? You told Inspector McAndrew. Oh. Thank you. Mmm. I say, this is good coffee. Would you mind telling me about it? What? Oh, finding the body, I mean. I told it all to the police. Oh, very well. I was coming home from the Spaniards along Windmill Lane when I How saw... were you coming? In my car. Uh, this is in my statement to the police. Oh, pity. 
I should have asked to see it, I suppose. Still... Well, I was driving along when the I The Spaniards. Saw... Why did you go there? I like it. Long way, though, isn't it? Right the other side of London. I like it. Did you go on your own? Yes. Or come back with anyone? No. Did you arrange to meet anyone there? No. Look, what's this got to do with finding a body? I really can't imagine. Anyway, you went to the Spaniards on your own, met no one there, and came back on your own. Yes. Oh, of course, you didn't have much to drink. Well, I wasn't drunk, if that's what you're suggesting. Oh, well, certainly not. I just mean you wouldn't have many as you were driving. Yes. Now, the body. Well, as I was driving along, I saw this man by the edge of the road. I, I pulled up and went back to him and... Did you see anybody near the man? No. Were there any other cars about? No. Well, when you got out of the car, you must have looked in the mirror to see if there was anything coming up behind you. Uh, no, I was on the... Uh, it wound up. I, I didn't look. But no car did go past me, fortunately. No cars around. No people. Oh, it must have been rather creepy. Yes. That was courageous of you, I must say. I, I, I didn't think. How was he, exactly? Who? The man by the roadside. Oh. He was lying slightly on his side with his head on his arm, almost as if he were asleep. But he wasn't. You're quite sure? His eyes were open. Oh, I see. Could you describe him, do you think? I'm sorry. He was very ordinary. When you saw him, what did you say? My God, he's dead, or something like that. To yourself, of course. Of course. Then you will telephone the police from the next call box without giving your name and address. I didn't want to be involved. But you went back to the police afterwards. I changed my mind. Oh, I see. Is that all? No. Just one more thing. Who was with you? I told Please, you, Miss I thought... Coney. An attractive young woman doesn't drive halfway across London on her own, drink on her own, drive back on her own. You weren't sitting in the driving seat of whoever's car it was. You didn't go back and look at the body on your own. And when you saw it, you spoke to someone. Well? You're quite wrong. Look, they're bound to remember you at the Spaniards. What is it? You having an affair with another woman? Certainly not. That's a... Ah, so it's a married man. Look, I just want to talk to him. His wife won't be involved. They're separated. If she knew about me, well, not me exactly, but that Harold has a girlfriend... I understand. Harold said, if we both gave our names to the police and the story got out, you know what people would say, two civil servants out for a night's boozing and a bit of slap and tickle in the edges. So your friend is a civil servant too. That'll make it easier to call on him at his work. Is he at the Admiralty? Yes. Harold Robson. He's in distribution at Thorley House. Thank you. Oh, and thank you for the coffee. Mr. Hart? Yes? Why are you making inquiries? Well, the police, I could understand, but D.I. No, whatever it is. No, it's routine when it's a Ministry of Defence employee that's involved. Oh, yes, of course. The body, what, what do you think happened to it? But if you must know, I think it got up and walked away. But you said that, that, you... That, that, but... that was a slight abridgment of the truth. I really mean I expect there was something that looked like a body. Very like a body. I see. I'm sorry. You know, it's one of the unfortunate facts of life that the people who answer questions have to tell the truth, but not those who ask them. Now, I'm one of the askers. Good night, Mr. Hart. Good night, Miss Coney. Mr. Robson, my name is Hart. I expect Miss Coney has told you about me. No. Really? Well, I'm from the Ministry of Defence. Let me hear. I see. Is it all right to talk here? Well, if you'd like to come into my office... Well, the government aren't any more generous with space than they are with money, are they? Well, it's the size of office appropriate to my grade, I suppose. Well, what do you do here, Mr. Robson? Well, I record the, uh, the movement of all the files and manuals and books, things like that. I make sure they get to the people who ask for them, that they're signed for, and that they go back to their appropriate section. Uh -huh. I've seen Miss Coney. She told me all about your finding that man at Hampstead Heath the other night. Oh. She said she wouldn't tell anyone. Well, obviously, she had second thoughts. It was the right thing to do. I am afraid I have questions to put to you. And uh, June explained uh, about us and uh, my wife. Yes. Well, I suppose you must think it was selfish, but... Well, he was dead. At least I thought he was. I didn't really look all that carefully. 
There was nothing we could do. To tell you the truth, at the time, I didn't even want to phone the police. But someone might have killed him and left him there. Or killed him? But the roadside. And what happened to the body? <sighs> well, I must have been wrong. He looked dead, but... Well, thank you, Mr Robson. But, Mr Hart, there, there's no need for anyone else to know about this. <laughs> I mean... Well, if my wife thought I had a girlfriend... It's not that I mean anything to her. I, I expect she'll divorce me sooner or later. But if she thinks I want my freedom because I've got someone... She'll hang on just to spite me. I understand. Do you, Mr Hart? I doubt it. People don't know what it's like if they haven't lived it. It, it eats away at you. So if you do find someone worthwhile, like June, you'll do anything to hang on to them. Almost anything. Well, I don't see any point in making this public. Any of it. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hello, Petra. Hello, Mr. Hart. Mr. Coleman's expecting you. You look blooming. Well, it is spring. Mm, for you, maybe. It comes a little late for me. Later every year. I can wait. Tut, tut. Well, now. If Hart's there, send him in, Petra. Yes, Mr. Coleman. Story of my life. I'd love to hear it. Soon. <laughs> well? Oh, do you mind if I sit down first? I saw the woman who found the body, June Coney. She'd been out drinking with her boyfriend, Harold Robson. They both work in the Admiralty. She's a typist. He's one step above a messenger. He's married, so they didn't want to get mixed up in anything. Oh, God, these people with messy private lives. Was there a body? You know damn well there was. That's why you sent me. And you know damn well where it went. Into the house on the hill. The K. Gay Bay branch office. What did you tell Miss Coney and Robson? Oh, I told them they were mistaken. It must have been a drunk who got up and staggered away. And? Well, she didn't believe me, but she will eventually. And he doesn't care one way or the other. I suppose he just wants to stay out of trouble. Who doesn't? Do you still keep sherry in that cupboard? Yes. Thank you. Well, what's it all about? Uh, there was a, a new arrival at the cultural mission last night. Sergei Penkarsky. You know him, of course. Oh, yes. General Penkarsky of the KGB. One of the old-time survivors. He's about as cuddly as an Epstein statue and as cultural as a kick in the crutch. I do wish you'd leave your vulgarities at the door. I like shoes at a mosque. I've been getting information out of the cultural mission. Just as I suppose they've been getting it in. Undoubtedly. Yes, I had a man inside. Had? I fancy he was the disappearing body at the roadside. Some time ago, my man reported he thought he was under suspicion and he asked for the message passing system to be trained. So you did? I didn't. It would have been too complicated. I told him to be careful. I'm sure he was grateful for the advice. No messages came out for a while. Now they've started coming out again in the correct code. Well, then he's all right. The correct code, except for one thing. The security check is missing. Well, what about the quality of the information? Uh, it seems good, but it'll take a long time to verify. Now, as I see it, the probability is that they've killed my man, found his code book and list of drops, and decided to feed us misleading information. But I can't be sure. Oh, it's really most vexing. If they have killed your man, he probably thought it was rather more than vexing. Mm. To return to my hypothesis that the Russians have killed my man and he's using his code book, I want you to set up photo surveillance of all the drops. When the next drop is made, I intend to know who made it. It sounds so simple. But the opposition mustn't have a scintilla of a suspicion. How many drops was your man using? Here's the list. Oh, God. By the way, am I supposed to recognise anyone in these photographs? No. I am. What time is it? Uh, nearly 9.20. Oh, if we hurry, we can see the play of the month. Well, I, I don't think I should stay that late. Oh. Well, it's not over till nearly 11, by the time I get home. Yes. Well, darling. Mm, it's all right. It's, she's phoned a couple of times. Late. What for? Well, nothing, really. Just to check up on me, I suppose. Oh, if only. What about the weekend? No, it should be all right. Good. It's our last one before I go on leave. I uh, suppose you still haven't managed to persuade your chief to let you change your dates. I only wish I could. Well, shall we have our coffee in the other room? Yes, all right. What do you think really happened? About what? That night. Ooh. 
I thought he was dead at the time, and you said he was. I suppose he must have been drunk or ill or something. No, I'm still pretty sure he was dead. Then what happened to him? No, it Oh, wasn't... there have been lots of cases of crooks disappearing, gang warfare. Yes. But just forget it. It's all ancient history now. None of our business anymore. Are you going to sit there just talking and drinking coffee all night? I've got to go soon. <laughs> Silver-tongued seducer, you. <laughs> What sort of people do you have working on this business, Hart? Failed beach photographers with box brownies. Look at these pictures. I think some of them are rather good. Particularly the one with the girl in the prominent jumper in the background. I'm in no mood for your juvenile flippancies this morning. Sorry. Three drops made and not a single decent picture of our man. I don't think that's the photographer's fault. They are good men. The subject was being very careful. He's a professional. Yes. Which possibly means, perhaps even probably means, it's a Russian plant using one of their men. Well, what about the messages they've dropped? As before, in the correct code, but without the security check. Yes, sounds very much as if your man has been clobbered. Who was the body by the roadside? But you still want a photograph of the man they're using to make the plants. Of course. You know, it may be a new man we don't know yet, but if your people on photo surveillance can't do any better, we never shall. Is there something else? Oh, yeah, a loose end. Robson. Harold Robson, the man who saw the body. Yes. Well, I checked his personal file. He was divorced five years ago. So... Well, the reason he and June Coney gave for not waiting for the police was that they didn't want his wife to find out about them and cause trouble. That's your loose end? Yes. I think you'd find more profitable loose ends in a plate of cold spaghetti. There is something wrong there. There are times, Hart, when you stagger me. Why should Robson be involved? All he did was drive past the body with his fancy piece. I mean, it's a thousand to one coincidence he was there at that particular moment. Not necessarily. What was he doing up there anyway, on that particular night? Oh, for God's sake. That there's something wrong with him. Something hidden, dishonest about him. No, he, he's worried. Oh, very well. Have a go, Robson. Thank you. Oh, don't thank me. I think you're being completely irresponsible. And when you fall flat on your face, I shall put an adverse report into your file. I see. I shall enjoy thinking over the precise wording. Well, if you get stuck for a word, let me know. Petra, do me a favour, will you? Official or... Private. In office hours, official, of course. Oh, well. Call Central Registry and tell them I'm coming over. I want to have another look at that file on Harold Robson. Oh, and while I'm at it, I'll have a look at Miss June Coney's, too. Thanks, Petra. Think nothing of it. I run a 24-hour service. Comforts for the troops and all that. You do have my home number. Tattooed over my heart. Mm. All right. All right. Oh. Oh, I've had more enthusiastic greetings. Is this an inconvenient moment? Oh, no. I always ask people to call when I'm in the bath. Really? You must put me on an invitation list. You know what I mean. I suppose you'd better come in. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll wait while you get dry. I am now. This bathrobe's better than a couple of towels. Can I get you something to drink? I've got some coffee on again, actually. Thank you. Do your lot always call in the evenings? Uh-huh. That's when people are at home, usually. If we're lucky, we catch them in the bath. Ha, ha. What's it all about? Uh, the same old thing. But there's no hurry. Let's wait till we have our coffee. Uh, unless you've got a date. Oh, no. Matter of fact, I'm off on holiday tomorrow. Where? Costa Brava. Economy package tour. Well, the sun's the same, whatever the price. Going with anyone? No. You haven't broken it off with your boyfriend, Harold Robson? No. I've got an extra week. He can't get leave at the same time. That's all. Yes, it must be difficult with his wife and everything. Is that what you're here about? No, no, no. Sorry. I wasn't trying to be nosy. I, I was sympathising. You're sure it isn't some sort of security check to see if we'd be vulnerable to pressure, single girl, married man and all that? <laughs> what? These days? Besides, what do you know that could tilt the balance of power in Europe? True. Sorry, but I have to ask you this. Will you try and remember the other night? The man. Can you recall how he was dressed? Why are you bringing it all up again? Well, we're helping the police on this one. They're undermanned at Hampstead. It might have been the uh, reglement de compte between villains. A what? A settling of accounts. Oh. Well, he... He was ordinary. Expensive clothes or cheap? Neither one thing nor the other. Not very fashionable, I don't think. What does Harold say? I haven't asked him. Men don't remember clothes as well as women. Even men's clothes. Yours are pretty memorable. Thank you. Can you remember what Mr. Robson said? Nothing, really. He was more concerned with keeping me away. And quite right, too. 
I suppose you've never seen the man before? No. At least I don't think so. Perhaps he'd look different from what he normally would, you know. Yes. Has anyone been reported missing? Lots. It happens every day. But without a description. And if he was a villain and he was dead, no one will report him missing. I suppose not. To think of it, he could have been dead and no one would know how it happened or why. Well, as you said before, he probably wasn't dead. Almost certainly wasn't. Did I? Well, that's the big city for you. What made you come to London? Well, same as everyone else, I expect. Streets of London paved with gold? Hardly. Anonymity? Maybe. Isn't that another name for loneliness? At first. But the freedom's worth it. <laughs> I suppose you can't cough in a Sussex village without everyone knowing it. It is a bit like that. Do you get home very often? Oh, one weekend a month, sometimes two. Your mother's still alive? Uh-huh. Uh, my father died during the war. Yes. I suppose she worries about you. Says she's sure you're not eating properly. Asks you if you're going to get married soon. How did you know that? All oh, mothers are the same. So she doesn't know about Harold Robson? No. So that is what you've come about? No, no, just friendly interest. I'm afraid it doesn't sound like it. Looking up my personal file... Oh, yes, yes, you must have done. You knew where I came from about my father being dead. Routine. My... Well, I'm sorry. It's not my sort of But routine. I didn't mean it to be an imposition. It's worse. It's an inquisition. Look, I assure you, I have if no... If it's not, it's a rather nasty, clumsy pass, and I can do without either. Thank you very much. Good night. Yes, uh, June, uh, Miss Coney did phone and tell me you'd been to see her. Mr. Robson, you weren't frank with me. Oh, you mean about my wife? Ex-wife. Yes, it uh, wasn't very bright of me to try to fool you. No. Look, I told June soon after I met her that I was married. It was a sort of insurance. Stop it all getting too serious. Well, she accepted me on those conditions. Yes. Look, do you know what the salary is for a civil servant of my grade? I mean, look at this place. It's all I can afford. And don't say two can live as cheaply as one. I wasn't going I've to. been married. I've had some. I know what it's like. If June thought I was free, if I told her I wasn't married, we'd probably just drift into marriage and, and kids. And, well, almost whether we wanted to or not. Yes. Well, now, if she meets someone better off than me, she's free. On the other hand, if we find out we are right for each other, well, eventually I can tell her my wife's divorcing me after all. I understand. And so the other night I had to pretend and go on pretending. Hmm. You like a beer? Thanks. Oh, oh careful. Oh, forgotten I'd put that there. Uh, it, it's all right, it's empty. Just trying to tidy up a bit. There's nowhere to put suitcases in a place this size. I mean, can you imagine the two Ms. of us? Miss Coney's place is bigger. Well, I, I couldn't somehow. Oh, thanks. Cheers. Uh, cheers. You know, to tell you the truth, when June went to the police, I was glad, really. Do you still think there was a body? Yes. And I'm sure that he was dead. Then what do you think happened to him? Well, I expect he was a crook. They did disappear, didn't they? So I believe. I'm afraid I still can't tell you anything more than I have done. Well, can you remember how he was dressed? No. Well, was he well-dressed? Flashy? No. Ordinary. And about 35 to 40. Dark, did you say? Yeah, that's right. He could have been Irish. Dark. Blue eyes. What? His eyes were open. Oh, yes, yes. Miss Coney said that, too. Oh, short of sending Frogman down in Hampstead Pond, I can't think of anything else we can do. Good Lord, is that the time? I didn't mean to keep you so late. Oh, that's all right. Ah, well, good night, then. Good night. Petro! Petra, come in here, will you? Yes, Mr. Coleman. Have you managed to contact Hart yet? No, not yet. Oh, devil take the man. He knows he's supposed to keep in touch. Who's that come in? Uh, Bellamy, sir. Right, come on in, then. Right, sir. Have you heard from Hart? Uh, not since yesterday, sir. Uh, all right, Petra, thank you. All right, Mr. Coleman. Well, what have you got there? Well, things have started popping, sir. Uh, first, we got pictures of the man who's been dropping messages. Uh, uh, well, come on, come on. Ah. There you are, sir. Now, that's him there, right in the act. Well, now... You know him? Oh, yes, I know him. That's Vasily Ivanov. Huh? He's supposed to be a cultural attaché, but he's a major in the KGB. Uh, then your man inside is dead. <laughs> he, he wants a body, sir. That's one problem solved. Well, not altogether. 
And uh, this is the message he dropped, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, short. Won't take long to decipher. Fancy. Uh, Petra, put out a red tracer to find Hart and tell them to keep on until he's found. Yes, Mr. Cole. Is he in trouble, sir? Well, not from the opposition, from me, for disappearing. We've got to get hold of this Ivanov very soon. How do we do that? Just go in and grab him? There's a refreshing elementary directness about you, Bellamy. You would have made a good uniformed policeman. As a matter of fact, you will. Sir? No, oh, never mind. No, we don't have to go in and get him. According to this message, he's coming out. And there they are. Admirably punctual, Bellamy. Sir? Shall I take them now, sir? Uh, no, wait a moment, Constable, till the traffic clears a little. We don't want too many witnesses. I've never felt the collar of a Russian, especially a Russian diplomat. Yes, well, don't make a Zephyr any production of it. As a matter of fact, I was thinking more of a sort of sub Jean Luc Godard verite. <laughs> I am very properly rebuked, Constable. Ah, now I think. Are you aware you went through a red traffic signal, sir? Nonsense. Vasily. May I see your driving license, please? I don't have it with me. In any case, I have diplomatic immunity. Then perhaps you'll be good enough to show me your passport, sir. I don't have that either. Do you think a member of the diplomatic corps carries his passport with him all the time? This car doesn't have a diplomatic road fund license. I have my passport with me. Here. You're not driving, sir. This gentleman is. Sergeant, I think we might ask the driver to blow up the bag yes. for us. Yes, yes, I think we might. Uh, would you mind stepping out of the car, sir? I most certainly would. Varsity cooperate. We can complain later. Oh, very well. Would you please blow into this bag, sir, and fill it with one single breath? Here. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Take that thing away. Here, take care. Would you? You saw that constable. He tried to hit me. I saw him, sir. You were lying. Fascist. Right, come along into the car. Take your hands off him. He is a member of my country's diplomatic staff. Yes, sir. Uh, come on, sir. Where are you taking him? I insist my embassy be informed. You can do that at the station after we've charged you. Fascist, you will pay for this. I'm going back to the embassy. I'll inform them at once. All right, you can relax now, Ivanov. Your friend's gone. Hello, Coleman. That all went very smoothly. Well done, Bellamy. Most realistic. Sir. And you too, Constable. Uh, Cannon Row Police Station, I think, as our friend is claiming diplomatic immunity. Are you telling me... No, I'm not telling you. You've guessed. You don't have to worry about Bellamy. What about the Constable? Is he all right? Him? Oh, yes. He's not quite what he seems. Um, in the best possible way. Right now. Borisenko suspected me and caught me making a drop. So I had to kill him and plant everything on him. Including the code book. That's what made Penkowski believe me, eventually. Mm -hmm. He didn't know about the security check in the messages, though. The information is worthless, I suppose. Yes. Well, we'll make it look as if we're acting on it. I take it you were being watched when you made those last drops. Yes, we knew you'd heard about the body. Who from? We have someone in the Admiralty. I don't know who. So, Penkowski was aware you knew about the body, but you couldn't know whether it was your man Borisenko or someone else. It was obvious you'd be carrying out surveillance, probably photographic. Yes, of course. So, to keep in character, I had to avoid identification until this last drop. You put in a priority alarm signal. Yes, now listen carefully. I learned that the English agent we, uh, they have on the outside, signals when he has something to pass by sticking a small map pin in the bottom of the door leading to the lavatories at the Spaniards Inn. Two days ago, there was a green pin, top priority. And so I took the risk of contacting you. Someone from the Admiralty is going to change briefcases with Penkowski. It will contain details of the modifications and communications equipment of the nuclear submarines. Where's this going to happen? London Airport. He's catching a scheduled flight to Copenhagen, then on to Moscow. And it's today. Bellamy, sir? Uh, call up on the radio, find out when the next scheduled flights to Copenhagen are due out, and if there are connections with a Moscow flight. India Delta Master to India Delta One. India Delta Master to India Delta One. 
please inform time of departure from London Airport of next scheduled flights to Copenhagen and whether there are connections with Moscow flights. Over. India Delta One, we'll go. Now what about the man who's making the handover? Or a woman. They're leaving the country today as well. For good. The Spaniards in. Someone in the Admiralty. Oh, Hart was right. Oh, blast the man for disappearing. Bellamy, sir. have Robson and Miss Coney picked up. Yes, now. sir. India Delta Master to India Delta One. Detain for questioning Harold Robson, Distribution Department, Thorley House, Admiralty, and June Coney, Department S17, Admiralty, Whitehall. Also check at home addresses. India Delta Master, over. India Delta One, Wilco. Pity we had to pick you up in this way. It's going to cause a lot of trouble. Your people will act very, very angry. And suspicious. We'll declare you persona non grata. But it'll lose you from London, but it will help diminish suspicion. You'll have to go to sleep for a while. But you can always take up your work again in a new posting in a year or two. I'll be in touch. You'll never let go, do you, Coleman? I prefer to say I never forget old friends. Ah, Karen Rowe. India Delta One to India Delta Master. India Delta Master. Next scheduled flight's Copenhagen. Take off at 15.50 hours, connects with Moscow flight. 17.40 hours, no connection. 21.10 hours, no connection. A message from India Delta 14 for India Delta Master. Oh, come on, come on. Ogre Star 3 left embassy 30 minutes ago and took M4 westwards. Master, roger out. 15.50, that's less than three quarters of an hour. Ogre Star 3? Penkarski. Ogre, three-star general. I like that, sir. Yes, well, Penkarski's left now. Constable, take the prisoner into Cannon Row and charge him. Yes, sir. I expect he'll want to contact his embassy after that. Good luck, Ivanov. And good luck to you, Coleman. Right, London Airport, Bellamy. You drive, I'll be using the radio. And you can play with the siren as much as you like. India Delta One, this is India Delta Master speaking. India Delta One. I want our man at London Airport to call me as soon as possible on this wavelength. Who's on duty now? Wait. 33, sir. Oh, Stanley Barnes, it would be. Make this grade one priority. Wilco. And keep this channel clear. Your rate tracer on India Delta Three. No contact, sir. Roger. I tell you, Bellamy, when I find Hart, I'll crucify him on Admiralty Arch personally. Get out of it, you deaf and blind tortoise. India Delta Master? Yes. Your message re Robson and Coney. Neither at work today. Robson not at home. Coney starts seven days leave, reportedly in Spain. Roger. What's happened with the London Airport call? Going out now, sir. British European Airways announced the departure of flight 725 to Barcelona. Passengers please go to gate number 7. Here is a special announcement. Will the representative of Coleman and Company please contact his travel desk immediately? They might have switched the briefcases already, sir. No, no, they'll do that at the last second. Penkarski won't want to risk being caught with those sort of documents on him. We couldn't hold him, but it would mean he'd be a marked man, persona non grata everywhere. We could delay the aircraft, sir. Oh, Penkarski would smell a rat. He'd dodge the contact. Damn it. Now, I want to get Penkarski with the documents on him and get the person who passes them to him. India Delta, Master. Master. London Airport reports 33 is not answering broadcast calls, sir. Tell him to keep trying. India Delta, one will come. Taking Penkarski has got to be done at the critical moment, at the train driver. Too soon, there'd be a fearful diplomatic row, yes. and too late, well, he'd trumpeted been framed by the perfidious British and had something planted on him. Here is a special announcement. Will the representative of Coleman and Company... General Penkarski? Yes? Your flight will be called soon, sir. You'd like to come with me Coleman to the VIP Company lounge? Of course. His travel desk. In here, sir. I rest it by the door. Whatever you like, sir. Shall I take a briefcase for you? No, thank you. Oh, then perhaps I can bring you a drink? Yes, vodka. 
A large one. How long before we go? Not long. Don't worry, I'll let you know. They won't leave without you. It's going to be too close for comfort. Into Delta, Master. New Delta One. Where the hell is that man, Barnes? He hasn't answered the call, sir. Well, keep trying. Out. I don't know who I'll crucify first. Hart or Barnes? Are we going to make it? Look, do try to hurry just a little, Bellamy. Sir, we are doing over a hundred. It doesn't seem all that much faster than the airport bus. Hell! That was close. Yes, we may make it. I don't know. <laughs> we have to make it. As long as the tunnel at the airport isn't too crowded. How much longer? Uh, they're finishing provisioning the aircraft now, sir. Matter of moments. At least the tunnel's fairly empty. Oh, for God's sake, slow down, man. Uh, we're not a scheduled flight. BDA flight number 585 to Copenhagen is now boarding... Would you place. like to follow me, please, sir? Ah. Uh, do you have everything? Oh, you won't forget your briefcase, sir, will you? No, I won't forget it. The VIP lounge. This way. That's him. He's going out, sir. Yes, and he's got a briefcase. Now, wait. Has there been a, a handover yet? You stop him, and there's nothing in that case. Yes, but if we let him go, and he has got the documents. No, I must. If he's clean, you'll be for the eye jump, sir. Oh, won't we all? General... Sir, sir. Barnes, where the devil... Sir, Penkarski. Yes, yes, Barnes, let's go. Sir, wait, it's all right. I mean the general, if you'll just come with me. We can still hold the aircraft now, sir, if we have to. Yes, all right, Barnes, where... Over here, sir. I suggest you start thinking up some reason for your dereliction of duty. In here. Good afternoon, Coleman. Hart, I don't think I'll crucify you and Barnes. After all, I'll have you publicly burned. Uh, this gentleman with the black eye and torn jacket is Harold Robson, Distribution Department, Thorley House, Admiralty. That briefcase on the table there contains documents he was trying to distribute rather irregularly. We stopped him. I see. Details of communication equipment and modifications in nuclear submarines. Fancy. Now, if you'll be good enough to explain, starting, for example, with why you've been out of touch... Well, it didn't dawn on me till this morning. When I saw Robson at his flat last night, I noticed a packed suitcase. But it didn't register then. And Tell I was me as a matter of interest, how did you know it was packed? He stumbled against it. It was obviously full, but he said it was empty. That was rather a slight cause for excitement, was it not? Then I remembered something he said. He was talking about the body. He said it had dark hair and blue eyes. What is so monumental about the... Uh, oh, yes, I see. That and the packed uh, sorry, suitcase? Sorry, but uh, will someone explain? What sort of street lighting is there where Robson and his lady friend saw the body, Bellamy? Uh, sodium vapour. Yellow. Ghastly. Oh. You couldn't tell what colour a pillar box was, let alone someone's eyes. So Robson had seen the man somewhere before. He knew what colour eyes he had. And thought it important enough to conceal the fact that he had seen him before. Yes, yes, all right, all right, Barnes. Now, Robson, isn't it? Is there anything you want to say? Nothing to say. Well, if you change your mind, you'll be given every opportunity. Hart? You know, all this didn't dawn on me until this morning, when I was driving towards the office. I nearly rammed a bus. Can we possibly manage without the colourful minor details? I decided to rush round to Robson's place right away and see if he made a break for it. If he hadn't already. And? And before you ask me why I didn't call in, mm. have you tried to find a phone box that works in London? I knew Robson might be going any time. Maybe in a couple of hours, but maybe in a couple of minutes. So I had to keep his flat under constant surveillance until I could get through to you without the risk of missing him. And? He came out carrying a suitcase and a briefcase. I followed him here. And arrested him? But I had to. You've seen how crowded it is. I could have lost him. I probably would have done too if I hadn't spotted Barnes and got him to give me a hand. I see. Barnes, you heard the broadcast messages calling for you to report. Will you please tell me why you failed to report? He was helping me to pick up Robson here and keep him quiet. He was quite a handful, sir. Violent and noisy, it took both of us. Really? Now, Mr. Robson, you've been most patient. Is there anything you'd like to tell us? Nothing to say. Like where you got the documents you were going to pass over? Nothing to say. His job was low-grade and unimportant, but it gave him access to high-grade, important material. Oh, thank you so much for explaining. What about the Coney woman? Oh, Lord. I've forgotten all about her. Ah, and what had you forgotten about her? Well, she was booked on a package tour to Spain today. 
So in case Robson had given her the documents to bring to the airport, we took her off the flight and had her searched. And? She's still in a detention room. Mm -hmm. Then you'd better explain to her. And get her on another flight. Yes, I'd better had. Well, that seems to be that. More or less. I wasn't expecting an instantaneous OBE awarded on the battlefield, as it were. Not even thanks. But After really, such think, a but... botched, inept job of work? I beg your pardon? Do you know to whom he was going to deliver these documents? To General Penkarski. So I rather thought he might when I noticed Penkarski in the doorway of the VIP lounge carrying a duplicate briefcase. Then why didn't you let this, this, this person deliver it and get both of them? That is a very good question. Uh, it was because, uh, frankly, I didn't want to take the responsibility of detaining someone like Penkarski. With your record for unparalleled intemperance and unconcern, you astonish me. Besides, for all I knew, he might be one of your men, and the whole thing a plant to strengthen his cover. I'm not impressed, Hart. All I know is that a unique opportunity to arrest Penkarski has been criminally wasted. You can always fire me. Oh, I'm not going to give you that happy release, Hart. Right. Bellamy, Barnes, take Robson away. Right, we'll sir, get them to charge him with Duck's French. Oh. Official Secrets Act. And I suppose you wouldn't care to explain to Miss Coney. She might be impressed by your authority. Oh, she's much more likely to be impressed by your celebrated charm. And don't forget, my office, 9.30 tomorrow. I suppose there is no point in reminding you that you said it wasn't worth following up, Robson, that I stopped the documents leaving the country. Leave the speech in mitigation until tomorrow. Good afternoon. Oh, uh, enjoy your chat with Miss Coney. So I'm no longer under arrest. My dear Miss Coney, you never were under arrest. Now, whatever gave you that idea? Illegally detained, then? They're helping us with our inquiries, and we're most grateful. We've arranged a place for you on a scheduled flight, and you'll join up with the rest of your party at Benidorm. Actually, it'll be a much more comfortable trip. I still think I'm entitled to an explanation, at least. Yes, you are. Well, I have some rather bad news for you. What? Harold Robson has been arrested. What for? Official Secrets Act. I'm afraid he was a spy. Harold? Oh, mad! So ordinary, nice and thoughtful. Spy? There must be some mistake. We caught him with his hand in the till, as it were. I can't believe it. I'm very sorry. It must be difficult for you. Just because you suddenly say he's a spy, I can't switch off my feelings like that. No, of course not. He was arrested here at the airport. That's why we had to be sure you weren't involved. Look, if you'd like to put off your holiday for a while, I expect I could wait. Here? Up... What was he doing here? Going on holiday, but he didn't plan to come back. But he told me he couldn't get leave. That's not the only lie he told you. He's not married, either. What? He was divorced five years ago, and... Divorced? Yes. Ever since we met, he didn't have a wife? No. Oh, those stories about his unhappy married life at home, his, his wife who didn't understand him. They're all lies. Look, I know. I've got my car here. Why don't Not we just pop married. it? No. No, thank you, Mr. Hart. Will I be required to give evidence? No, I shouldn't think that would be necessary. Well, if I am. Now, what do I do about my flight? Uh, are you sure? Quite, you... thank you. Besides, I think a holiday would do me good. There's a ticket for you at the BEA desk. Oh, women. Hello? Petra? Yes? Edward Hart. Is your 24-hour comfort for the troop service still in operation? Business or pleasure? Pleasure. Hmm, <laughs> definitely pleasure. That was Dead Drop by Max Marquis. Edward Hart was played by Eric Lander... Coleman by David Garth, Harold Robson by Nigel Antony, and June Coney by Patricia Gallimore. Production was by Christopher Venning. MacReady's Maelstrom, a play for radio by Roger Pine. When? Just after I came off watch. And he said that? Yeah. 
What had you done? How do you mean? What had you done, lad? You know, I mean, had you got on the wrong side of him somehow? What had you done? Oh, nothing. I was just passing, like, you know, in the alleyway by the galley. He sort of bumped into me, like, as he come out. And he said that? Yeah, that's right. Well, what did you say? Oh, well, you know, nothing much, really. You know what he's like. Oh, you mean you just took it from him? Well, what else could it do? He is the chief steward, isn't he? What the hell's he got to do with him? Well, what would you have said? That's got nothing to do with it, lad. It's you we're talking about. No, no, come on, McCready. What would you have said? Look, lad, you've done what? Three trips, four trips? About that. Well, there you are, then. Well, there I am. What then? There you are, then. That's the difference, see? I don't get you. Oh, my God, look. If it was me, he wouldn't have said it in the first place. He would have known better. You are? He thought he could get away with it with you. Besides, <laughs> I haven't got long hair. No, uh, no, this that. What I mean, what I mean is this. Is that with me, he would have known he would exceed in his rights. But I thought you didn't like long hair either. That's got nothing to do with it, lad. The point is that you're a seaman. If the mate says your hair's too long, then there might, and I emphasise there might, be something in it. But if the chief steward says it's too long, then you go away and grow it. Do you get me? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But it only causes trouble, doesn't it? Oh, for crying out loud. I thought you lot were going to change the world. What, me? Yes, you. You're the young generation, aren't you? You're always going on about everybody over 30 being past it. You don't like being told what to do and all that. Well, I don't. Well, then. What? Well, but, I mean, I don't want a dirty discharge either, do I? I'm only just starting. Then start as you mean to go on. Now, look, lad, you're a scouse, aren't you? That's what my dad told me. So, you know, what's what? I mean, generally speaking. Well, I've been around a bit, Of yeah. course you have, son. And if you want to keep on going around the right way, if you know what I mean, get it firmly fixed in your head. There's them and there's us, see? And they're just hanging around all the time, waiting to put the boot in, waiting to stamp on the back of your neck. And he's one of them. He's an officer. He's different, see? But, and it's a big but, these days, there's ways. There's ways, lad. Ways of what? Ways of putting them into place. Where are you? Where are you? Now, this chief steward, he said to you, a seaman, that you were a filthy little man, that your hair was too long for a duty, let alone a bloke, and that you'd better get it cut before he saw you again. Is that right? Yeah, more or less. Well, then, now, this is what we do. We go to the old man, and we tell him that the chief steward has accused the deckhand of being unclean in his person, that he has personally insulted him, and that he has implied that this seaman is a homosexual. Hey. All of which charges are, needless to say, totally unfounded, OK? But he didn't say anything like that. Yes, he did, lad. He didn't know he did, but he most certainly did, OK? OK. So, now, we've got him on interfering in another department's discipline, which the mate won't like, and we'll have to do something about. We've shown him up as causing unrest among the crew, which will give the old man heart failure, and apart from anything else, we even stirred things up a bit. But he won't do anything about it. Not so as we notice, lad, but the chief steward will, and that's the point, see. And as far as we're concerned, they're the ruling classes, and you know what we've got to do with them, don't you? Ah, oh, now, come on, don't start that stuff, McCready. I'm not interested in politics. Besides, I'm a Catholic. Aren't we all, lads? Aren't we all? But what's that got to do with it? I'm here to make sure that they don't have an easy life. And that's what, though I says it myself, I bloody do it. Oh, my God, look, Mike, drop it, will you? It was nothing. Oh, just having a bit of a whinge, you know, for something to say. That's all. I don't want no trouble. Oh, I'm sorry, lad, I really am, but... Uh... You know, you must have forgot my position with the union, mustn't you? Oh, come on. I'd like to let it go, son, but I'm afraid it's out of your hands now. You see, now that you've told me, it's a matter of principle. Principle? Him? He doesn't know what the word means. Oh, yes, he does, when he wants to. Anyway, that's what he said. What? The John or the old man? Oh, the old man, of course. He'd get short shrift from John with a fiddling complaint like that, and he knows it. I don't know how he gets away with it. I mean, once or twice, perhaps, but not all the time. Sometimes I wonder who's running this ship. McCready is. Didn't you know? The old man's scared stiff of him. Mr. Blecken. Mr. Cave, second officer. Sir. Shut up. Yes, sir. But why, sir? I think... No one wants to... to know what you think, lad. You occupy the very tenuous position of uncertified fourth officer in this vessel, do you know? I do. Which means you're officially still an apprentice, sir. So what makes you think you know more than the captain when it comes to handling bloody-minded deckhands? I don't. At least... Anyway, that's not what I said. He can handle them so they don't cause any trouble for him with the union or the company, but that's not well, really that's handy. that's enough from you for the moment. What are you doing here, anyway? I thought you were supposed to be on watch. I am. At least I was until five minutes ago, and I shall be again in another five minutes. What's going on? Well, the captain came up, said he wanted a word with Mr Backhouse in private, and would I please leave the bridge for ten minutes? Very peculiar. Couldn't he just have sent you onto the other wing or into the chart room? Yes, I suppose he could. But he didn't. He said, leave the bridge. So the bridge, I left. As he logged it... Well, not yet, but I'll make sure John does when we hand over officially. Don't you worry, third. I just hope we don't run into anything in the meantime. Officer of the watch was absent from the bridge at the time, sir. He's only a young lad, means well. Oh, but sometimes up, will you? 
As our revered second officer so forcibly pointed out, I'm really nothing more than an apprentice. Oh. I ain't got no ticket. So unlike you two elderly gentlemen, I cannot therefore be held responsible. I have the close and paternal supervision of John Backhouse, chief mate himself. Whenever duty demands, I shall come within the cable length of the wheelhouse. However, if you, Mr. Park, would rest more easily in your button boots, I shall, without further ado or delay, ensure that control of the motor vessel Karamu is grasped firmly once more in my own eager and capable hands. <laughs> That is, I think, what used to be known as a pretty speech. Oh, is that what it was? Anyway, what it all amounts to is that John's up there, the captain's up there, it's a flat calm, and there's not a blip on the screen. It'll be all right. <laughs> John's up there, it'll be all right. You thank your lucky stars that you haven't got his job, young Peter. And we don't make it any easier for him talking about the captain as though he's a half-wit when there are stewards hanging about. See what I mean, Peter? Yes. Yes, I do. I'm sorry, second. OK, let's leave it there, then. Now, uh, hadn't you better... Uh... Uh, sir... Uh, yes, McEwan, what is it? Captain's compliments, sir. Uh, would Mr. Brecken please return to the bridge immediately, sir? There you are, fourth. Off you go. Right here. Thank you, McEwan. Sir. See you chaps later. Oh, McEwan. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, some more coffee, would you? This lot's gone cold. Oh. Better make it a fresh pot. Oh, yes, sir. Mm. Straight away, sir. Bit hard on him, weren't you, Frank? Brecken, you mean? <laughs> well, he's got to learn, hasn't he? He's a good enough lad, I suppose, but he doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut. That's his trouble. Bit la -de da too, for my liking. Well, he can't help that, can he? Father's RN, you see. Broke his heart when young Peter didn't want to go to Dartmouth. Anyway, apart from all that, he's right, isn't he? About MacLeedy, you mean? Yeah. The old man is scared of him, isn't he? Don't know about scared, exactly. He certainly hates his guts, and he lets it show. That's the trouble. God help MacLeedy if the old man ever has a proper chance to get at him. Yeah, but in the meantime, MacLeedy gets away with murder, doesn't he? If it wasn't for John, God knows what this ship would be like. Just as well we've only got one sea lawyer aboard. The rest are so thick they just do what MacReady tells them. And one thing you can say for the blighter, he does stay within the law. These days, anyway. You should see his discharge book. He's thumped an officer or two in his time. He even went for one bloke with a knife about 20 years ago. Did he now? Aye. Did time for it, too. Don't know how he managed to get a berth after that. Still, these days, and provided he's sober, he won't hit you with anything harder than dust capital wrapped in the union regulations. <laughs> I wonder what the old man wanted to talk to John about. Too strong for young Peter's ears, anyhow. Want to bet what it was? No. It's a dead cert when you come to think about it. Wants John to sort old Smythe out. Tell him not to upset the seaman and keep his mind on his stewards. Anyway, I reckon we'll find out soon enough. Where the hell's that coffee? McEwen! Coffee! Jody! Steward? Stuart! Look, Mr. Smythe, you do see the position you put me in, don't you? If the man had been a steward, then of course it would have been your affair entirely, but he's not. And I'm not a simpleton first. You know as well as I do that without MacReady, the whole thing would never have been blown up like this. Well, I only told him to get his hair cut. Yes, and look at the result. He told MacReady, MacReady goes to the captain, the captain gets on my back and I get on yours. MacReady's laughing his head off. It's just the sort of thing he thrives on. In itself, it's nothing, but it causes friction. It gets people upset, and I don't want that in this ship. Yeah, well, it's about time something was done about that twerp. If we had a captain who didn't spend his life in fear and trembling of a union dispute, perhaps... I he... think the less said along those lines, the better, Smythe, especially to me. Oh, uh, all right. But you know it's true. I mean about MacReady. He needs standing on good and hard. If it's in my department... If it was I... in your department, we'd have a full-scale strike, but now we're worse. So you keep out of his way. And that's an order, Mr. Smythe. Just as you say. If that's all, I've got a lot to do. That's all. Oh, just before you go, there's something that does concern you. Oh? Chase up that young blighter McEwen, will you? For an officer's smoke room steward, he'd make a bloody good job in Gardner. <laughs> hey! <laughs> hey! <laughs> What's all this, then? What? You've had your hair cut. Yeah, no, we have. I ain't a bit time to us beginning to fancy you. <laughs> shut up, shut up, you Scots kid. We'll know about you. Oh, Connor. I thought I'd explain to you. I thought I'd troll you. Well, what have you did? Are you the bosun now or something? I got me hair cut because I wanted to get me hair cut. And I told you not to get your hair cut. I told you it was a matter of principle. A matter for the union. So what? So what? So what? Well, I can see you don't understand at all, sonny boy, do you? And little lads like you are a menace. And you're going to have to stop being a menace, aren't you? Come here, O'Connell. Get up. And come here. What for? Watch out for his head, Brian, boy. Don't let him put the head on you. I haven't... 
All right. If that's what you want. Well, here I am. Oh, Colonel, you must get things straight, lad. You know, your head is all muddled up. It needs a bit of a shake, don't you think? And you, you, you think you're the bloke to do it, eh? Well, go on then. Go on, have a go. You just all talk, eh? Well, that should do for the moment, don't you think, lads? He's not a bad kid, O'Connell, but he must learn to get things straight. Elliot, you wake him up. Aye. I'm going on deck for a bit. Well, come on, Brian. Come on, lad. Are you be OK? Hey, come on, that's, that's it, boy. Come on. Get Jimmy, get some water, eh? Right. Aye. Oh, that man's a bloody menace. You shouldn't have tangled with him. That's it, boy. Now, come on. Get, sit up slowly. Oh, my... That's it. It was a maze. It was a maze. Oh, Alex. I had to do it, didn't no, I? No, no, just take it quiet, boy, that's all. Oh, it was a mate, see? Oh, man. He told me, he told me to get it cut. Aye, well, never mind that now. Just sit there a wee while, eh? You'll be fine. Oh, I don't know. Somebody's got to have something done about that McCready. Aye, somebody's going to have to do something soon. Officers, crew, all of them. Right shower. Now who's... Oh, here we go then. Here we go. Hi, McCready. Good evening, Mr. Smythe. You were uh, just taking the night air, are you? That's it, Mr. Smythe. Just taking the night air. Have you, um, have you got a light on you? I seem to have lost my matches. Certainly, Mr. Smythe. Here you are. Thanks. McCready. Yes, Mr. Smythe. I want a word with you. Off the record, if you see what I mean. Oh? What about Mr. Smythe? Look, I said off the record. You can drop the Mr. Smythe business for five minutes. Oh, can I? Just as you like. <laughs> Finally decided to come slumming, have you bet? I suppose talking to you could be called that. Look, Mike, it was a long time ago now, wasn't it, when we sailed together? Things have changed. I haven't changed. I was an A.B. then, and I'm an A.B. now. But you're the bloody chief steward, aren't you, mate? That's what's changed. We're four weeks out, four weeks. Yeah, I was wondering when you were going to pass the time of day. Yes, well, like I said, things have changed. I can't hobnob like in the old days, now can I? I've got my position to think of, haven't I? Besides, the captain would never stand for it. <laughs> yeah. That's very true, he wouldn't. Well, so what's all this about, then? All right, I'll come straight to the point. I got the surprise of my life when I joined this ship and found you on it. Oh, did you now? And why is that, then? I am a seaman, you know, you often find them in ships. Don't be daft, you know what I mean. Do I? Yes, yes, you do. And I wondered. I wondered what you'd do about it. Whether you bring it all up again, if you tell anyone. What are you talking about? You know perfectly well what I'm talking about. San Francisco, 1949. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, that. Yes, I thought it might be that. Yeah. But you don't have to worry about that, Albert. I've not said a word, not to anyone. I mean, it's all past, isn't it? It's all over now. Is it? I don't think so. You've been trying to cause trouble for me ever since we sailed. Have I? I don't think so. If I had, you would have known all about it by now, Wack. Believe you me. Well, what about that business yesterday with young O'Connell? You can't deny that. You were behind that, all right. <laughs> Is that what's worrying you? Oh, you've got it all wrong, Albert. That was nothing personal. I just don't like offices. I just make things awkward for them whenever I can. Everybody knows that. <laughs> you gave me a chance, so I took it. I see. Oh, do you? Good. <laughs> oh, it's funny. It's really funny, you know. You still haven't got much of a clue, Bert. You get things out of proportion. I mean, think about it. If I was one to bear grudges, you know, I mean, if I wanted to stir up that Frisco business, just think what I could do. Just think what I did at the time, eh? God, it wouldn't just be getting you wrapped over the knuckles by the mate. Did he have a word with you, by the way? You could put it like that. Well, <laughs> well now, fancy that, eh? And fancy you thinking I was bringing it all up again, eh? You're still really worried, aren't you? 
Never really been able to rest easy. Oh, I like that, come to think of it. I like the thought of you sitting up there in a sort of muck sweat just because you come across me again. <laughs> it's funny. Don't flatter yourself. <laughs> it's just that... Well, it's a long time since I met anyone who was on that ship, let alone you. And you know what you did. You don't forget something like that in a hurry, I can tell you. I don't suppose you do. No, you don't. And then, finding you here and... And you start causing trouble all over again. Oh, and... so you had to come and have it out like, man to man, eh, did you? Yeah, well, that's fair enough. I understand that. And I'm telling you, forget it, lad. It's past as far as I'm concerned. That's not my way, dragging things out. Relax. I mean that. Do you? I wonder. But it's just like I said. It's years since I met anyone from that trip, and... Well, it, it wouldn't mean anything to anyone else, would it? Oh, probably not. Of course, you never can tell, can you? I mean, it's a small world. It meant something to poor old George, though, didn't it? Still, no point me going into all that. Forget it. Like I've done. Yeah. Yes, I will. But I had to find out. I had to know, didn't I? God, MacReady. Yeah? If you'd have been there. If you'd have been there, it might not have happened. But no, you had to go and get bloody drunk off on your own. You had to... Shut up. Now look, Smythe, drop it. I'm warning you, you say anything like that again and I'll batter you, Chief Steward or not. Now, you got it? From the smell of you, you've been on the bottle. So I'll let it go this time. But I'll tell you one thing you've made me remember. I don't like you. I don't think I ever did, really, even before. George was my mate. You just hung around with us, didn't you? Now, I think you'd better shove off now. I'm starting to remember too much and I'm getting angry. Oh, dear, Albert, I am. All right, if that's the way you want it. But just you remember, I am an officer now, so watch it in future. Oh, I remember that all right, Mr. Smythe, sir. But you remember something as well. You keep out of my bloody way and off my bloody back, or else I'll fix you and I'll fix you proper. Will you? You just be careful yourself, Abel Seaman MacReady. I've got ways. I've got ways too. Now, go on. Go on, off you go. You are in trouble, Mr. Smythe? Huh? Oh, Hello, sir. No, no trouble. You sure? Yeah, yes, quite sure. Just something I wanted to say to MacReady. I've finished with him now. On your way, MacReady. Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Pyatt. Mr. Smythe. Albert? Yes? You mean stirring things up with that blighter, have you? No, of course I haven't. Sounded to me as though you was having a row. Yeah, yes. Well, um... I look, third. I know you're the bridge and all that, but do me a favour, will you? Keep this to yourself. It was just something personal, that's all. Something that had to be said, and it's been said. OK? Well, yes, all right. I won't report it if you think there's no need. But for heaven's sake, keep out of his way. He says he fell over. Oh, does he? Quite a fall. A fall called MacReady, if you ask me. Oh, of course it was, but we'll never get O'Connell to admit it. Poor lad, he looks as though he's been under a steam hammer. What do you think happened? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? A matter of discipline. The cock of the walk, the forecastle boss, call him what you will, asserting his authority. O'Connell got his hair cut because I told him to. MacReady probably went off at half cock. Didn't wait to find out why. He thought O'Connell was backing down, opting out of the class struggle or something. Do you think we'd get anything out of any of the others? Oh, not hope. They know what had happened to anyone who split. O'Connell just got lightly done over as a warning. He doesn't seem very worried about it, I must admit. Just puzzled. I think MacReady had been quite friendly with him. As much as he ever is, anyway. You know, that man's becoming an enigma. It's ridiculous. The voyage of the Karamu, or what MacReady did today. That's what this trip should be called. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I'd better get up top and have a look around before I take over. Aye, right. aye. Right, it's freshening up a bit from the surrey. Glass is falling, too. I think we're in for a bit of a blow tonight. Well, there's plenty of sea room. And we've had an easy run so far for this time of year. Might make things a wee bit more interesting for a while. It's nine all the time now, sir. Must be gusting well beyond that. Yes. How she feel, quartermaster? She's still answering fine, sir. Good. So she should be. It's not a hurricane. Yet. I'll keep her at this speed for a while longer then, Mr. Cave. How's the glass now? Seems to have stopped falling, but that's about all, sir. That'll do for the moment. Must have been blowing hard to the cellar of us for days, sir. This sea didn't come from nowhere, that's for sure. Very astute of you, Mr. Cave. 
but at least I can keep my head into it without altering course, which is something. We may be making only four knots, but we are making them in the right direction. Uh, O'Connell! Yes, sir? Go below through the chart room and tell my steward I want some coffee for Mr. Cave and myself straight away. And tell him I don't care what he laces it with so long as it's whiskey. Now, go on, man. Jaldi now. Aye, aye, sir. I'm a bit worried about the deck cargo forward, sir. It's taken a hell of a pounding. If those drums get loose, it won't be very funny at all. Good God, man, you've had the lashings checked, haven't you? Mr. Byatt saw to it before I took over, sir. He got the awnings off her and sent the boatswain round all the loose gear as soon as he saw what was happening to the glass, sir. As he should have done. Yes, sir, but that was well before midnight, sir. We've had about four hours of this since then. Indeed we have. What have you in mind, then, Mr. Cave? Well, sir, I, I thought if... Oh, hello, first... Too rough for you to sleep in. Morning, sir. Morning, second. I'm worried about that deck cargo, sir. I think someone... Mr. Should... Cave was just about to give me the benefit of his experience on that very matter. No doubt what both of you have in mind is that I should reduce speed while a party goes down to have a look. Is that it, gentlemen? Well, uh, yes, sir. We've got lifelines rigged, but they're shipping so much, I doubt if anyone will last long on that four deck while we're ploughing into it like this, sir. Yes, indeed. We'll get the portion in two hands. That should be enough. Let me know when you're ready and I'll reduce then. But for God's sake, be quick, ma'am. I need nearly every rev I've got to stop approaching in this. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll get down there. Hello, Thor. It is a merry sir. Captain Thomas. What on earth's the matter, Mr. Peckham? It's Mr. Smythe, sir. The chief steward, sir. Get hold on yourself, Peter. What's happened to him? He's dead, sir. Somebody's cut his throat. You are, uh, <coughs> you are all well aware of the reason for this meeting, gentlemen. And no doubt you've had time to think about it. Unfortunately, as is so often the case in our profession, we have had to wait until the weather allowed us to discuss the situation. At 03.20 hours, on the morning of Wednesday last, that is four days ago, Mr. Brecken here reported to me that the chief steward, Albert Smythe, was dead, that he had been found in his cabin with his throat cut. There is no possibility of suicide, gentlemen. It was murder. Suicides do not usually go to the trouble of slashing their face, arms and chest, as well as their throat. The uh, weapon, almost certainly a razor, was not found in the cabin with the body, so whoever did it was not even concerned to make it look like suicide. <coughs> now, what I intend to do is this. I have, of course, already made a signal to the New Zealand police. They will board us as soon as we enter their territorial waters. That should be six days from now. Whoever they arrest will be tried in New Zealand. However, I have no intention of waiting for the police. A murder in a ship has some advantages, if I may call them that. The main one is obvious. The murderer cannot escape. He is still here on board. So, as I have already told Mr. Backhouse, I intend to hold an immediate inquiry of our own. I do not think it will be difficult for us to find this man, and if we are able to hand him over to the police as soon as they come aboard, it will look it, it, it will it will be better all round. The owners in particular will be pleased. Now then, uh, let us start with you, Mr. Brecken. Sir. Uh, once again, in detail, if you please, uh, tell us what happened before you reported to me. Well, I was off watch, sir. Normally I should have been asleep, but we were pitching so much that I could hardly stay in my bunk. Well, I decided to get up and rustle up some tea or coffee or something. I went down the alleyway towards the galley, and as I was passing Mr. Smythe's cabin, I, I lost my footing and fell against his door. It opened, and there he was, half out of his bunk, his head on the deck, and his blood everywhere, all over the bulkheads, even on the deckhead. Well, that's all, really. After that, I just belted up to the bridge and reported to you, sir. Right. Thank you, Mr. Brecken. Well, uh, what we have to do now is interrogate everyone on board. If this is to be a complete inquiry, then we must be thorough. We can more or less eliminate ourselves straight away, though I shall want a detailed signed statement from each of you by tomorrow forenoon yes. describing your actions on the night in question. Heads of departments will interrogate their own personnel and pass the reports to me. Is that clear? Yes, well, please remember, gentlemen, but we also want to know if anyone heard or saw anyone else do anything suspicious on that night, quite apart from anything they may have been doing themselves. However, I may as well say that I already have a pretty shrewd idea where our search is going to lead. If I am right, 
then it would be a most satisfactory result. Most satisfactory. <laughs> now, any questions? Sir? Ah, yes, Mr. Pyatt? Sir, uh, not a question really, sir, but it seems to me that the main thing we're going to be looking for is motive, isn't it, sir? We've got to find someone who had a reason for wanting to kill Mr. Smythe. That is correct, Mr. Pyatt, yes. Well, sir, I may as well say right now that a couple of days before the gale broke, sir, I overheard Mr. Smythe having a row with Abel Seaman MacReady, sir. It wasn't a matter of discipline or anything like that. I told Albert that I'd heard him, and he asked me to keep it to myself. He said it was a personal matter, sir. Did he indeed? Did he? Well, now, that is very interesting, sir. Very interesting. Uh, did you by any chance hear what they were talking about? Not enough to make any sense of it, but it was quite clear to me that they were on the verge of blows. Or they were threatening each other, sir. Ah. Well, now, <laughs> well, perhaps, perhaps we're going to have this thing wrapped up even sooner than I thought. And it seems to me the conclusion is going to be satisfactory. Very satisfactory indeed. You think he's Dixon of Doc Green or something? More like Judge Jeffries, if you ask me. You mean he's made up his mind already? That's about it. He's going on with the inquiry, all right, but it's a farce now. He knows who he's going to arrest. And you think he's wrong? I don't know. I'm all in favour of trials and juries and things like that myself. You know, a hundred years ago, we'd have had MacReady swinging from the main yard by now. Yeah, but do you think a trial's going to make much difference? I mean, he did do it, didn't he? Ah, looks like it. I did hear him threaten Smythe, didn't I? Yeah. And there was definitely something rummy going on between them. Well, whoever it was has got it coming to them. Should have seen the mess in that cabin. Glad I didn't. Even from what I overheard, it's enough to hang a man on, isn't it? They don't hang them anymore in New Zealand. They're the same as us. But I see what you mean. It's all a bit circumstantial, isn't it? On the other hand... If he didn't do it, who did? Hmm. Nothing come to light so far. I reckon it was him all right. I just don't like seeing the old man gloating, that's all. It's a sore thing he's been wanting to happen ever since MacReady joined the ship. And now... And now it looks as though he's got him by the short and curlies, doesn't it? Well, Mr. Buckhouse, all secure? Yes, sir. Good. Very much as I expected. Ah, it's nice to have things sorted out so soon, don't you agree? Yes, very nice. I can tell you it did my heart good when young McEwen said he'd actually seen MacReady up there that night. What with that and Mr. Pyatt's evidence and the man's past record, I think we've got him this time, Mr. Buckhouse. Yes, I, I don't mind telling you this is a very happy day for me. Yes, sir, I can see that. Yes, very happy. Of course, if we still don't know why did it do him. Well, how can we if he won't tell us? Hey, poor old Smythe certainly can't, God rest his soul, but then we're not policemen, are we, Mr. Parkhouse? We're not lawyers, after all. It's up to them to sort out the details now, isn't it? We've done what we can in the meantime, and all things considered, I think we've done very well indeed. It won't take them long to have a ferret around and find out what there was between Smythe and MacReady. They'll get it out of him. What happens now, sir? Now? Well, uh, since we've done all we can for the moment, now we wait. We wait until we get to Auckland. We wait for the police, and then for the trial, and then for the verdict. That's what we do. We wait. And uh, in the meantime, of course, we carry on running an efficient ship, just as we've always done. <laughs> Only now I think we'll find it a damn sight easier. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, just one other thing first. I, yes, sir. I don't want anyone to talk to him or uh, have any contact with him at all, come to think of it, until we've reached New Zealand. Uh, see the second steward and make arrangements about uh, food for him and so on. But but no one is to be left alone with our uh, prisoner. Eh? Uh, see to that, will you? Yes, sir, of course, sir. I thought I might have a word with him, sir, if you don't mind. With MacReady, I mean. Did you, Mr. Buckhouse? Oh, no, I, I don't think that would be wise, do you? How oh, You know what he's like as well as I do now, don't you? I think it's better if he's left nice and fresh for the police. Uh, we don't want to confuse the issue, now, do we? Uh, please make this apparent to the other officers, if you'd be so good. Well, uh, I think that's all for the moment. First, let's leave it there, shall we? But no one is to see him, Mr. Backhouse. No one. What? No one at all? That's what he said, Frank. And for once, I think he means it. He's like a cat that swallowed a cream. But you can't do that. I mean, the man's only a suspect at the moment. Is he? Yes, of course he is. That there's been no trial. On the evidence we've got, what do you think the verdict will be? Well... Guilty, wouldn't it? In fact, won't it? Once the coppers have dug up the background. <laughs> but that doesn't mean under British law that he can be treated at this moment as though he was a convicted criminal. 
He's been put in solitary confinement. <laughs> well, if you're going to be technical, he has to be. He's the only prisoner we've got at the moment. Oh, you know what I mean. He's being denied, oh, what do you call them, visiting rights. Well, isn't he? Yes, he is. But then this is a ship and it's got a master, a captain, and within reason what he says goes. It certainly does in this case. Well, if you put it like that. I do. It's an order and that's that. But... Yes? Look, Frank, you're worried about his legal rights. I'm not. He's a twerp. He's been a bloody nuisance to me for a long time. As far as I'm concerned, let him sweat for a while. It'll do the bigger good. But all legal niceties apart, if you were on the jury, even on the evidence we've got so far, what sort of verdict would you bring in? Yourself, I mean. But I wouldn't be on the jury. I know the man. That's one of the things I'm driving at. If you didn't, you might think differently. Anyway, what do you think? I think he did it. Yes? Oh, yes, well, of course I do. Well, look at it. He's known to have had a row with Smythe. He's got a past record of violence, of attacking officers. He's the most bloody-minded sea lawyer I've come across, and the cleverest. And to cap it all, he was seen in the alleyway outside Smythe's cabin by a man who was quite neutral, who's got no axe to grind one way or the other, on the night when Smythe was killed. Well, I mean, what would you say? I'd say he didn't do it. What? Look, I've told you. I don't give a damn about MacReady. I don't mind what happens to him in the meantime. The old man could have been flogged for all I care, but I do know him. I know him far better than anyone realises, including him. And that's the point. A copper, especially a foreign copper, won't know him. He'll go by the facts as he sees them. And he'll be wrong, just like you are. MacReady didn't do it. Then who did? God knows, but it wasn't him. How do you know? Because I know him. He's capable of it, I'll grant you that. I mean, he could have killed Smythe. He might have even wanted to. But he wouldn't have done it like that, and that's the point. That's the point I hope the coppers will see when they come aboard. Look, whatever you say about him, he's not stupid. You said he's the cleverest sea lawyer you've come across. Oh, I know I did, but... But nothing, Frank. Nobody but a madman's going to commit a murder like this one in a ship this size nine days from the nearest port, are they? Oh, perhaps not. But, well, perhaps he was drunk or, or just blood mad. You know, in a blind rage. McCready doesn't have blind rages. That's what's so nasty about him. If he wanted to get rid of somebody so much that he thought it was worth the risk, they'd have gone overboard. I reckon there's a nutter aboard somewhere. At least that's all I can think of till the coppers get going. It's not very original. I know it's not. But neither is immediately deciding it's MacReady. What I want to make sure of is that when the police do take over, they don't regard it as an open and shut case, the way everyone else is doing round here. The method's all wrong. If Smythe had been found ashore with his ribs kicked in and his jaw broken, then I'd have said straight away, get MacReady. But this... No. What are you going to do then? You mean I've convinced you? Mm, let's say... nearly. <laughs> ah, well, that's better than nothing. Oh, I'm not quite sure. I think I'll have a private chat with McEwen. He's the one who actually saw him, or said he did. And then? And then, if there's no other way round it, I'll have a little talk to the gent himself. Captain Thomas orders or not. I see. You really are worked up about it, aren't you? I suppose I am. But not for the reason you think. What do you mean? Well, the way I look at it is this. If there was still hanging, I might think differently, but as it is, I don't. Well, that's as clear as mud. Give us a chance, will you? Look. At the moment, MacReady's well on the way to getting locked up for life, or for a long time, anyway, and that'd be nice. I don't like him very much. The world would be a better place, I reckon. What? Even if he didn't do it? Even if he didn't do it. There's a lot he has done he'll never be caught for, you can bank on that. Nope. So what I mean is, I wouldn't lose a wink if he got lumbered with this business, but for one thing, if they convict MacReady, the swine that did do it's going to be laughing, isn't he? That's what worries me. You think on it. Now I'll go and have my chat with McEwen. All right, McEwen, sit down, will you? Thank you, sir. Will you have a cigarette? Thank you, sir. Light? Uh, thanks, sir. Right, then. Now, let's have a little chat, shall we? I never get much chance to talk to you stewards, except to yell for more beer or something, eh? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> well, I thought we'd try and put that right. How long have you been at sea, McEwen? Uh, about two years, sir. And uh, why did you decide to come to sea? In the family, was it? Well, in a manner of speaking, sir. Yeah, what manner of speaking? Well, my daddy was in the Navy. Oh. RN, sir, during the war. <laughs> was he? So was my father. Where did yours serve? Mostly in the Atlantic, sir. Uh, but he was at the Dardanelles. Gallipoli, sir. He was there. That was the First World War, son. Uh, aye, sir. That was the war he was in. Was he? How old are you? Uh, Twenty, sir. Oh. Is your uh, father still alive? 
Oh, no, sir. He died, sir, when I was about two. But my mammy brought me up. Uh, she's dead now, no, sir. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, McEwen. What did you do before you come to see? Oh, I was a waiter for a while, sir. Uh, that's how I got this job. And before that, I was a sort of kitchen hand and that kind of thing. You know, sir, peeling tatties and washing up and that. I see. Do you like your job now? Oh, yes, sir. I, I like it fine. Oh, that's good. Tell me, do you, uh, do you like women? Oh, I sir. You could say women were... Uh, <laughs> One of my hobbies, sir, <laughs> if you know what I mean, sir. <laughs> I think I do. Thank God for that. Well, now, McEwen, you uh, never thought of being a seaman? Oh, aye, sir, but I I'm no very big, you see, sir, and, well, I had the experience of the cater inside. Oh, yes, of course. Well, that's all very interesting. Now then, tell me, lad, off the uh, record, as it were, what did you think of Mr. Smythe? The chief steward, sir? Ah. Uh -huh. Oh, well, uh, he was all right, sir. You liked him, did you? Well, I mean, you know, sir, he was my chief and I was just me, if you follow my meaning. You mean you didn't really know him? Uh, that's it, sir. I only come across him in duty and discipline and things like that, sir. You did not met him before you joined the ship? No, sir. Now, how about McCready? Do you know him? Oh, well, sir, everybody knows McCready, sir. Yes. You had much to do with him, have you? No, no, really, sir. Stewards and seamen, well, we kind of keep ourselves to ourselves. But you're sure it was him you saw in the alleyway that night? Oh, aye, sir, I know him that well, all right. Oh, what were you doing there? You weren't on watch, were you? But I've told you this, sir. I've told the captain, I sir. know you have. Well, tell me again. Well, it was like I said, sir. In the gale, sir. I couldn't sleep, and I was worried about the stuff in my pantry, sir, so I came up to a look. Yes. Well, the place was a bit of a mess, sir. Things had fell over and broken, that, sir, so I started to get it all ship shape, and, well, I did what I could at that time of the night. Well... Well, I'll be honest, sir. You do that. Well, I thought I'd just have a wee dram and a QT, so I, I put the light out and... Well? Then, well, it, it was then I, I looked out do, down the alleyway. You, you know, sir, just to see if... Yes, I know. Could... Get on with it, lad. Yes, sir. Uh, well, that's when I saw him, sir. McCready, sir. He, he was coming out of Mr. Smythe's cabin, Was sir. he? Well, you didn't say that before. You said you saw him by the door. Well, I mean, it, it looked as if he was coming out, if you see what I mean, sir. I mean, he was by the door, like, sir. I see. You'd better make up your mind, lad. You've got to go through all this in court, remember. What did he do then? Well, he, he went off, sir. Down aft. And he was looking all around him, sir. But he didn't see you? No, sir. I tell you, I had the light out in my pantry, sir. And I was half a hint the door, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems fair enough. That'll do for now, McEwen. The Sir. police are going to be asking a lot of questions when they come aboard, so we've got to have everything ready for them, haven't we? Right then, cut along now. Oh, right, sir. Here, I hope I've been some help, sir. What? Oh, yes, 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 you have, McEwen. You have indeed. Well, John? Oh, I don't know. I really don't know. Oh, why not leave it to the coppers? If you're right, they're bound to see the same loopholes. They'll know it's not as simple as it looks. Oh, will they? Or will they just see a way to a quick arrest? Did you get anything out of McEwen? Nothing we didn't know or couldn't guess already. Except some family history and a vague feeling. Now I'll keep that to myself for the moment. It's facts we want. Look, what about young O'Connell? He had a grudge against Smythe, didn't he? Nobody seems to have worried about him. <laughs> I have. He was on watch. Bridge lookout. With you, as a matter of fact. Yes, I know, but I've just remembered. The old man sent him below to get us some cocoa. When? Just before you came up. You were worried about the deck card. Oh, aye, aye. But he wouldn't have had time then, would he? I'd only been there a couple of minutes when Peter came charging up saying Smythe was dead. Besides, you don't go around carving people up like that just because they tell you to get your hair cut. Or do you? Oh, it's something else for the coppers to worry about. I don't know. There seemed to be an awful lot of people wandering about the ship that night who should have been tucked up in bed or on watch. There was Peter who just happened to be passing and found the body. Oh, for heaven's sake, John. You can leave him out oh, of it, surely. Oh, I know, I know, I know. But he was there. And then there's young McEwen, who hadn't got any motive either, but he was there too. And now there's young O'Connell, who might have had a go, but probably didn't. And there was MacLeedy, who probably did. Aye, ah, it doesn't seem any way round it, does there? But why? Oh, let's have a drink, then I'm going to turn in. I've had enough sleuthing for one day. I've got a ship to run as well. The coppers will be aboard tomorrow anyway. Then maybe you'll relax. Maybe. But there's one more thing I can do before I give up. What's that? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to see McCready and the L with the old man. Steward, two beers. Each. John, don't be daft. Let it rest now. The man's not worth it. He's just not worth it. Hello, McCready. 
Well, well, well. It is my old friend, Mr. Backhouse. And to what do I owe this honor? They tell me you're not worth the bother, McCready. What do you think? Oh, they're very probably right, whoever they are. All right, what's your honor about, Mr. Backhouse? Nothing. I just thought it was time we had a chat. Police boat will be alongside in about four hours. <laughs> then all the details by radio, of course, but they're bound to want to go over it all again. I thought we might get a few things straight first. Do you feel like talking? Look, I've told you, haven't I? I'm not saying nothing until they give me a lawyer. And he'll be a good one too, mark my words. I've got a few mates even in New Zealand and they know their way around. Oh, yes, of course. The party's everywhere, isn't it? Well, I'm glad about that. You're going to need mates. Now, wait, look. What is this? If you just come here to gloat, no, then... No, no, I haven't. I'll tell you why I've come here. Ah, thank God for I've that. I've come because I'm the only one in this ship that's prepared to give you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> you what? You heard me. I don't think you did it. Oh, what's going on around here? What the hell does it matter to you whether I did it or not? You're getting rid of me, aren't you? That's what you want. I mean, you're not going to stand there and tell me you like having me aboard, are oh, you? Oh, no, 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 I'm not going to... I don't think I'm ever likely to do that. Well, thank God for that. I was beginning to think I was a failure as well as the scum of the earth. Well, what is it then, eh? Do you fancy me or something? I don't give a damn about you. If you drop dead now, I'd laugh. But look at it from my point of view. If you don't open up now and tell me exactly what happened that night, it's odds on that you're going to be locked up for a long time, a long way from home. I'm trying to stop that happening. And there's nothing personal in it. It's nothing to do with you. I just don't want the bastard that did do it to get away with it. If they lock you up, he's going to be laughing, isn't he? Now look, forget I'm an officer and that you're the great white hope of the revolution and look at it like that. Look at it like that and talk sense. Yeah, I think you mean it. I really think you mean it. All right then, Mr. Backhouse. What do you want to know? Did you do it? No. No, as a matter of fact, I didn't. But the trouble is, I haven't got a clue who did. That's one of the reasons I've kept my mouth shut, see? I had to have a think first. But whoever it was, made a horrible mess of him, didn't they, I? Eh? Yes, they did. But how do you know? How do you know what he looked like? You don't mean you... Yes, I do. I saw him after. Oh, yes, I was there, all right. I even went into his cabin after he was dead. Why? Look. Look, you better sit down. This is going to take a while. Now I've started, I better tell you the lot. But I'll tell you all about old Smythe and all that. Now, you, you got a fag then, have you? Yes, sir. Right. Here you are. Ta. All right, then. Here we go. Well, it... Mr. Backhouse, what is going on? Well, well sir, I, I gave I just... specific orders that no one was to speak to this man until the police were aboard. And you, the first officer, have chosen to ignore those orders. Well, we'll have to do something about that, Mr. Backhouse. Oh, yes, we will indeed. Have you seen them? Yes. Very big, aren't they? They are. And not exactly brimming with humour, would you say? I would. And how about intelligence? I don't know about that yet. Lots of what they call experience, though, don't you think? Yes, I do. That's what worries me. The old one didn't look too bad. A bit keen, perhaps. Definitely brighter than his boss, though. Perhaps. But we mustn't go on first appearances, young Peter. We might be right. <sighs> Horrible thought. Oh, well, someone's in for a hard time, that's for sure. Come on, let's have a jar while there's some left. Right. I need it, just for a change. What additional evidence? Well, first thing they did, apparently, was check the crew list. No motive this trip, it seems, so who in this ship had sailed with Smythe before? Had anybody got a record? And they'd come up with a beauty. What? Well, it all makes sense of what young Harry Pyatt overheard. You know, that row between Smythe and McCready? Yes. Hey, you wouldn't believe it, would you? The only man in the ship that had sailed with Smythe before was MacReady. About 1949, I think they said, on the American run. You know, the Atlantic and round the coast. Yes. Well, apparently in California, San Francisco to be exact, two British seamen were arrested for rape. Got drunk and had a go at this girl. She was a tart, but the Yanks are very hot on that sort of thing. She said it was rape, so it was rape. Rape and kidnapping. And in 1949, that was a capital charge in California. What happened? One of them was found guilty. He went to the gas chamber. The other one turned state's evidence and got off scot-free. He sold his mate up the river, so it seems. And his name was Albert Smythe. I see. Well, who was the other bloke? Young fellow called Nesbitt. George Nesbitt, Scotchman. Yeah, there should have been three of them. Those two were part of a terrible trio. Great mates, inseparable, in everything together, you know the sort? But who was the other one? A Liverpool Irishman called MacReady. Michael MacReady. Our MacReady. Oh. Yes. Oh. That's what I said. Trust MacReady. He had a cast-iron alibi. 
For once he'd gone off on his own. He was already in jail, drunk and disorderly. And they think that, that after oh, all this I time... Oh, there's more yet. The coppers are in touch with the captain of the ship they were on. After Smythe came back aboard, MacReady thumped the living daylights out of him, put him in the sick bay, and organised the whole crew against him. Sent him to Coventry and that. Well, that's that, isn't it? That's enough for them, apparently. If he gets a good lawyer, there might still be a few holes in it. That's what MacReady was going to tell me when the old man came rushing in, wetting his pants, damn him. I might have found out in time to get something organised. You mean you still think he didn't do it? You still think there's somebody else? I'm bloody sure what there is now. MacReady, wait that long, you've got to be joking. If he wanted to have done Smythe, he'd have done him then. Oh, he'd, he'd get more fun out of making life hell for him. It's safer, too. Oh, but that's only guessing. With everything else there is against him, he's a dead duck now, John. They've got a motive. That's all they needed. Aye, maybe. But I'm not the only one that's not satisfied. I've got half the police force on my side, young DC Cargill. I've had a chat with him. Right, lad, that. Should go far. He's making one or two little inquiries of his own. On my behalf, as it were. When I heard that story, something clicked. Something that's been bothering me for a long time. You wait and see, second. This isn't finished yet. Not by a long stroke. You wait and see. Mr. Backhouse? Oh, Constable Cargill, come in. Well? Yes. You mean? Yes, you are right. There is a connection, a very strong one. And I think we've got him. What does Senior Sergeant Boyd say? Oh, I haven't told him yet. He's going to be ropeable. You want to tell him? Well, not quite yet. I want to try something first. Will you back me up? All the way, lad. My old man's not going to exactly fall on my neck either, except with a chopper. What do you want me to do? Well, look, this is what I thought. Most of it's up to you, really. OK. OK. Come in. You'll be yourself. Oh, yes, thanks to you. Put it down there, will you? Thanks, sir. You pour them, will you? Yes, sir. There are three, sir. Ah, that's right, lad. One for me, one for Mr. Cargill here, and one for you. For me, sir? Yes, one for you, Nesbitt. What? <coughs> Shit! Watch him! Watch the razor! I've got him. Drop it, boy. Drop it. That's it. Now, sit down. Don't you, you tell me what to... Sit down. Okay, John. Now put him on. That's better. Now then, McEwen or Nesbitt or whatever your name is, let's have another little talk, shall we? There are all sorts of things we want to know. <laughs> and you're going to tell us, aren't you? Well, there they go. Can't say I'm sorry to see the last of them. Mm -hmm. Any of them. Seemed like he was enjoying it. He's not normal, is he? That's what his lawyers will say. You can bank on that. Can't say I'd ever noticed much wrong with him myself. Never thought he was very bright, but that's about it. But he must be a nutter. To do a thing like that and calmly go on serving coffee and beer and trying to help everyone who asked him anything about it. The moment they accuse him of it, he breaks down and makes a full confession. <laughs> if he's not barmy, then I am. I just don't understand it. Well, we'll see what comes out at the trial. Makes it go cold all over, doesn't it? Hmm? What do you mean? Think about it. If it wasn't for John getting a bee in his bonnet, they'd have made a pretty good case against MacReady. We'd have sailed off happily into the sunset and that little swine's still aboard. Yes. Thing is, we probably would have been safe enough. He just seems to have had this one twist. I wish I knew what put John onto him in the first place. I'll tell you. Later. Now that we can stop playing coppers, perhaps we can get back to being seamen again. We're moving into a proper berth on the tide. There's going to be press everywhere, so I want this ship to be a credit. How about you two old women still in your gab and doing something about it? Come on, let's get it alongside. Then I'm going to get very drunk. And you'll both be welcome to join me. Well now, uh, Mr. Backhouse, let me put it like this. Can we... Can we let bygones be bygones? You were right, and I was wrong, and I'm sorry. Things could have been a lot worse. Well, the main thing is they're not, sir, so, uh... Cheers, sir. Cheers first. Now, for heaven's sake, will you tell me how you found out why McEwen, what on earth, put you on to him? Well, luck, really, sir. I'd had another talk to him after we'd interviewed him together, you see, sir. He told me a lot about himself. Mm. He lived in a world of his own half the time. It didn't ring true that he'd get up in the middle of a gale to tidy up his pantry. Uh -huh. But I let that go because he admitted having a sly dram out of one of our bottles. 
No, it was nothing specific, sir. It was just a, a general feeling. There had to be somebody else. I see. But it wasn't until the police came up with that tale about MacReady and Smythe in the States that I could see any reason for anyone wanting to kill Smythe. But once again, MacReady didn't fit. He'd never have waited 20 years. So what if there was somebody else aboard who was connected with that business? I mean, half the crew of Scots and yeah. the man who went to the chair in Frisco was a Glaswegian. Uh -huh. Was there a pal, or more important, a relative? And in particular, what about McEwen, do you see, sir? Oh, yes, I do indeed, Mr. Backhouse. Well, Go on. There wasn't time to check them all, at least not unofficially. So I took a chance and persuaded DC Cargill to dig up McEwen's background. And that's what did it. He didn't seem to have one. Nothing at all before he came to see. Uh. So Cargill did the routine thing and found that he'd changed his name by deed poll just before he joined his first ship. He changed it to McEwen from Nesbitt. Uh -huh. And Nesbitt was the name of the chap that was executed in America in 1949. Uh -huh. They were brothers. Never met each other, but they were brothers. The young one was born the year the other died. So we tried it on. And it worked. The boy is mentally disturbed, isn't he? Mm, probably is, sir, but uh, only about this one thing. I mean, of course, the life he'd led in the Gorbals doesn't actually produce perfectly adjusted types, yeah. but it seems as though he'd been weaned on the idea of getting the bloke that had done for Brother George. Yeah. Ah, now he's more or less happy. I mean, he went for a razor when I called him Nesbitt, but almost straight away after that he relaxed. <laughs> Wanted to talk about it. Seemed very proud of the old thing. But didn't he know about MacReady, that, that he'd been a great friend of his brother's? No, apparently not. That's the daft thing, that they all ended up in the same ship again. He's got a poetic justice in a twisted sort of way. Exactly who is benefiting from the justice, I'm not quite sure, except perhaps MacReady. <laughs> and uh, that brings us to another point. Have you seen him? Have you talked to him? Oh, only the once, sir. I told him that McEwen had been charged and that he was more or less in the clear. What did he say? Well, he said, uh, thank you very much for all your help, but I know you didn't do it for me, so don't expect me to be grateful or words to that effect. Typical. Yes. So... If the police are satisfied, it rather looks as if we're stuck with him. <laughs> oh, no, not not quite, not quite. Uh, I have some resources first, some resources. I, I have been in touch with the company, you see, and they have suggested, I may go so far as to say, they have agreed that in this eventuality he is to leave the ship. What? <laughs> yes, that is what they have agreed. I mean, after all, after what he's been through, there is a case for what might broadly be called compassionate leave, eh? <laughs> hey, Mr. Backhouse, and MacReady is to be flown home rapidly, Mr. Backhouse, rapidly. <laughs> flown home? Me? What for, Mr. Backhouse? I should have thought it'd be obvious. Well, I beg your pardon, sir, but, uh, I don't understand. Don't you? Well, that's what's going to happen whether you understand or not. You better get your dunnage together. Ah, oh, just a minute, sir, just a minute. I don't want to get home. I'm quite happy here. Are you? Yes, sir. And besides, I signed on for the round trip. I can't leave the ship. I can't leave you in the lurch like that. MacReady, you are going home. It has been arranged, the company have agreed, the captain has decided, and I'm telling you, get it? You need a rest. And you are going to have a rest. But I don't want a rest. I've got a job to do. Huh. What are you going to get an A.B. with my experience, eh? As far as I'm concerned, MacReady, I never again want an A.B. with your experience. The job you have to do can be done in some other ship. No, I think that's all I have to say to you. There'll be a taxi waiting on the dock in 30 minutes. There will be an aircraft leaving Mangary Airport two hours after that, and you'll be on it. You'll be home for Christmas, lad. Think about that. After all you've been through, it should be very nice for you. Think of Lime Street on a wet day. All right, the McCready, on your way, lad, on your way. <laughs> yeah. I've got no choice, have I? That's it, lad. For once, you've got no choice. It's a blooming maelstrom, lad. A blooming maelstrom, and you're right in the middle of it. You've been listening to Henry Stamper as MacReady, Patrick Towle as John Backhouse, and John Sampson as Frank Cave in MacReady's Maelstrom. Pyatt was played by Roger Gale, Captain Thomas, Alan Downer, Peter Brecken, Derek Seaton, O'Connell, Ronald Forfar, Albert Smythe, Wilfred Carter, McEwen, Michael Deacon, and Abel Seaman Elliot, Richard Griffiths. The play was written and produced by Roger Pine. We present a play from Wales. But don't let you know it.
I say don't for a single moment let's kid ourselves as to exactly what the esteemed councillor is fishing for. Right. Mr. Chairman, I do not intend to stand in this chamber and be insulted by Councillor Traherne or anybody else. I say we know what he's fishing for. And why, why do we know? Because he's dangled the same blinking bait before. But for once, for once, I say... We refuse to bite. All very well, isn't it? All very well. A fair assessment of the situation, he calls it. He has the nerve to call it. Estimates, he calls it. Except fables, more like. A trip to Fairyland, more like. I demand that that remark be struck from the record. Cordian Cordland, more like. Except, except that not even a five-year-old would give it the time of day. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I really must protest. Of course you must, because, because for once, Mr. Councillor Mostyn Roberts, this chamber sees through you, sees exactly what you're up to, sees that it is simply another attempt to hoodwink this council in general and the finance committee in particular. An attempt, an attempt, to instigate the acceptance of a motion which can be guaranteed to rook the majority, hoodwink the minority, and line the pockets of Mr. Bloody Mustin Roberts in particular. Retract! Retract! I demand that you retract! Here. Here, boys. Give him air. Meredith Edwards and William Ingram in Stranger at the Gate by William Ingram. Blast them! Damn man, blast them! Was you knocking, Father? Knocking? Oh, no, not me. Must have been the woodworm having a field day. Oh, sorry. I must have been out the back. What doing? Oh, just a breath of air. Now ease up and I'll, I'll do your pillows. A breath of cotton wool in your ears, more like. Or maybe just a case of let the bedridden old devil wait, eh? What did you want then? For you to turn that damn noise off. That's what I wanted. Te oh, oh, but it isn't a wireless, Father. Evening service from Bethesda Chapel. Well, we hoped you might hear. Cass just happened to mention to the Reverend it's always been one of your favourites, so he goes and puts it in special. A sort of grand finale. Well, we both thought he was very thoughtful of him. Close the window, girl, for goodness sake. Jesus bids us shine. But you always used to like it. I remember you saying to our man... So mind. let's just say there's been a bit of change in the weather forecast, shall we? Oh, you've hardly touched your tray. No. Oh. Of course, it'd be just like the Reverend to come up with a half-baked idea like that. I don't... Oh, with you and Sister Cassie doing your fair share of encouraging, I've no doubt. The Reverend. You can forgive him for being parsimonious, all part of his job. But the man's a parasite and an idiot. Ten years in the mission field, Father. The cannibals couldn't stomach him, so they pass him on to us. Ten years? And couldn't even make the grade as a pot boiler. Aren't you going to look at your get well cards? Read one, you read them all. Bad poetry and false sentiments. Wonder is, nobody's got round to printing a die quick card. They'd make a fortune. There, there was a lovely bunch of gladioli from Councillor and Mrs. Lewis. Probably the nearest they could get to Aram Lilies. Oh, Dadder, I don't know how you could lie there and say such things. Because they happen to be true, that's why. Get well cards, gladioli. Do you think I don't know what they're really wishing? If wishes were deeds, you'd already be passing the wreaths out of the window. 
Well, if there's nothing else you want. Uh, Sarah, uh, he, he hasn't come yet. No, not yet. But there's another train at eight. Cass was thinking... Well, when he gets here, no keeping him down there, not straight till all hours. Send him straight up, do you hear? Yes, father. Uh, wait a minute, girl. Well, girl. No, only the doctor. Cass is sending him up. Good evening, doctor. Sarah, my dear. Still playing the lady with a lamp, I see. Oh, just collecting the tea tray, doctor. Must in, you old villain. And how are we feeling this evening? There was a taxi a bit back. Who? Oh. Mm. Thought it might have been him. Looked a bit like him, but there was a woman as well. He might have got married. Not likely. But he might. Not likely. Oh, he hardly touched his tea. Probably too busy scheming. I suppose all those pills and medicine affect his appetite. Was he uh, asking again? What? Was he? Oh, yes. And what did he say? Just asking. Hmm. Can't think why you bothered traipsing up to the old stick. I told Dada there was another train at eight. And if he's got a hip of the decency, he won't be on it. But... Well? Well, you're just thinking. I mean, with Dada... Well, the way things are... The way things are have got nothing to do with it, do you hear? Nothing. No, Cass. Oh, yes, Cass. No, Cass. God, you're as damn soft as what that old stick is. I only oh, meant... I know what you meant, all right. If you had you away, you'd be tearing around this very minute. Cakes in the oven and a bunch of forget-me-nots in his room. It's still your very own little room, yes, in Bach. Just like you left it. All right. But he left it. That's the point. Oh, it was so long. The point, Sarah. So if he thinks rolling up with his tail between his legs is going to get him back his warm corner in this kennel, he's got another thing coming. This tea is still warm. Would you like oh, to listen cut? while I'm talking to you? Oh, dear, dear. Now, look, Sarah. You don't seem to realise what's behind it all, do you? Maybe you think it's some little game the old stick's playing. Happy families, is it? With a big dollop of the old forgive and forget thrown in. Enemies in life, but reunited at the last. Well, if you think it's as simple as that, you've got another thing coming. Because it doesn't fool me, my girl. And if you get any sense, you won't let it fool you neither. Was that a car? And if you'd use your head, none of this need ever have happened. God knows how he got hold of his address in the first place. But you should never have let the doctor talk you into sending that telegram. But with you not being here, and I know it was what Dada wanted, and, and the doctor saying it can only be a matter of time the now, I... The an outsider. What would he know about it? Huh? Cures for some things, I dare say. But there's no answer to our problems in that little black bug. Perhaps the telegram never got there. Uh, lost in the post. Oh, he might decide not to come. I mean, the way things were between Yestin and Dada when he left... He didn't leave, damn you! He was thrown out, Sarah! Dada threw him out. So, maybe I did. Maybe I did. What does it read? Hmm? What does oh. it read? Wouldn't mean anything to you if I told you. Now then, make a fist. That's it. <coughs> Cry, baby. Right. You can roll your sleeve down now. So, you need him back. I don't need anybody. All right. A change of heart, though. You could say that. Why? What are you blathering about? Why? That's what worries me. Worries? Well, the intrigues, then. The why, the reason, the motive. For the best part of 20 years, you haven't so much as mentioned the boy. 18. Wouldn't have his name mentioned under the same roof. Didn't even get round to telling him the time and place of his own mother's funeral. It's none of your damn business. You're supposed to be a doctor, remember, not a father confessor. Just the 
way things were. Oh, you don't have to tell me how things were. But now, suddenly, I know, a change of heart. So? <laughs> well, what would be more natural? Oh, it's natural, all right. Only unnatural thing is that you didn't get round to patching things up years ago. Then why are why you going Because, going on? to put it quite bluntly, I've never known you capable of a 100% completely natural act in the whole of your life. It implies a certain disregard for the consequences, an area in which I've always found you somewhat lacking. <laughs> you see, I've known you too long, Mostyn. Known you since you had no backside to your trousers and hauled cold rams up Valre for a bob a week. We've come a long way. A very long way. I dare say there are some who would reckon a damn sight too far. Oh, I dare say. Councillor Mostyn Roberts. The self-made man, more of the good things in life than he knows what to do with. A bank account that'll leave most of the others standing. A business that can only make things go from better to best. The living proof that anybody can go anywhere, that a nobody can become number one. Oh, no, not anybody. Magnate, magistrate, man of the people. Fifteen years sterling service as councillor for his ward. Sixteen. Nine of them as chairman of the chamber. Ten. OBE, MBE. Not to mention his Civil Defence Medal, second class, then. There's been some talk of a knighthood. I bet there has. A long way. And maybe even further. Oh? Oh, maybe not much further in the practical sense. You wouldn't be making with a bedside manner and sticking blunt needles in my arm four times a day if there were much chance of that. But there are other ways, aren't they? Of being remembered, I mean. The deeds men leave behind them? <laughs> Something like that. There'll be the new wing on your blinking cottage hospital for a kick-off. A boon and a blessing to generations yet unborn. And so it ruddy well should be. If they were making this cement with gold dust, it couldn't get much steeper. <laughs> a drop in the ocean and worth every penny. Besides, think of all the nice things the big wigs are going to say about you on dedication day. The Mostyn Roberts orthopedic wing and civic gratitude knowing no bounds. Well, they'll probably chuck in a couple of bonuses. Oh? Why not? Maybe a nameplate on one of those skyscraper blocks on Windy Heights? Or how about an avenue of elms in Cedar Park? Hmm? I can just see all those precious little poodles spending their pennies and woofing God bless the governor. Try and get some sleep. I'll look back a bit later. Just uh, popping off to grind down a few more needles. Don't bother the girls. I'll find my own way out. The deeds men leave behind. <laughs> Right, haven't I? Yes, Tin? Yes, Tin Roberts? Yes. Thought it must be. Obvious, my dear Watson. In the first place, your sisters reckon you'd be coming on this one. In the second, you're the only one to get off it. And in the third, when you've slapped someone on the backside and brought him howling into the world, it leaves a lasting impression. Dr. Marsh. Well, well, well don't just Sorry. stand there. Catching our deaths, hop in. Uh, nothing's happened. I mean, I'm not... No, 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 no. Nothing's happened. Last. Keep meaning to clean the plugs, but I never get round to it. That's my girl. She'll warm up in a minute. I'm fine. It was uh, good of you to meet me. Mm, wasn't it, though? Just on the off chance. Usually pop in to see him before they get him bedded down for the night, so I thought I'd stop off and see if you put in an appearance. Besides, is the very devil getting a higher car on a Sunday. All too busy. Either bastioned at Bethesda, making peace with their maker, or downing pints at the rugby club. <laughs> Get over, you idiot! But as I say, it was strictly on the off chance. We didn't get a telegram with a time of arrival or anything, so we didn't exactly know when you'd be showing up. Or if I'd be showing up. It had crossed my mind. But not father's? Not so as you notice. <laughs> That's typical, isn't it? What? Absolutely ruddy typical, isn't it, though? All these years without so much as a postcard, yet he thinks when it suits him, all he's got to do is snap his fingers 
and Boyo comes running. Why did you? What? Come running. Good question. I wasn't going to. I swore I wasn't going to. When I got your telegram, the first thing I did was tear it into a hundred pieces and pretend it had never happened. Then I spent the best part of an hour jigsawing it together and trying to read between the lines. You'd be surprised how difficult it is to arrive at a true picture. Seriously ill. But how bad is serious? Pretty serious. Or just another of his tricks to get me back, right back under his thumb again. Now, there's no trick. No, I... I didn't really believe there was somehow. So, how long do you think? Not much longer. Does he know? No. Oh, I've always maintained that in the final stages, the patient usually has a much better idea than the doctor. But you still haven't answered my question. Why did you come? Heaven only knows. I still can't really believe I have. As far as I was concerned, I thought that particular return ticket had expired a long time ago. Well, not because I give a damn whether he pulls through or not, that's for sure. I've already told you there's no question of that. Well, how could I? I don't think I ever really loved him. Not in the real sense. Did any of us? My mother, perhaps, in the very early days. But we watched that die. You must once have cared. Cared? A kind of caring, perhaps. But caring can become just some kind of habit, can't it? Pretty meaningless compared with the real thing. In any case, he didn't manage to stifle that by the time he got to the final breakup. You're still here, so what is there left? I'm not sure. Curiosity, I suppose. Curiosity and a kind of disbelief. Daft, I know, but the kind of thing one of these white hunters must feel when he lines up some giant thundering bull jumbo in his sights and then pulls the trigger. Watching it fall, seeing all that mass and power and energy, all that threat, become as helpless and threatless as a newborn babe. Oh, yes. Curiosity, certainly. Or I could just be looking for the conventional ending, of course. Couldn't it turn out to be something as corny as that? The full east of Eden, you know that scene right at the end? Beloved kith and kin gathered round the deathbed, confessions and prayers and forgiveness at the last. Well, why not? Couldn't it turn out to be something as corny and simple as that? Why not? Why not? Except that... Deep down inside, I know it's none of these things. Some kind of test, I suppose. Doctor? Doctor? Is that you? Yes. Oh, thank God. Come quickly, will you please? Come quickly. Some kind of test. No change, I'm afraid. Yes, he's still with him. Of course, the very minute. No, no, I won't forget. Goodbye, then. Oh, and then thank you for calling. Oh, must be the tenth this morning. Hmm? Did they wake you? Uh, <laughs> no, not really. I'm just dozing a bit. Councillor and Mrs. Trehearn. Ah. Cass says we ought to take the thing off the hook. But it seems a bit heartless when people are being so kind. Oh, I nearly forgot. They sent their regards. The chairs? Yes. Well, why not? Well, it's a bit of a turn-up, isn't it? I shouldn't have thought they'd remember me, let alone know I was here. My, you have been away a long time. Well, you know how things are. You've only got to step off the train and the jungle drums start beating. In your case, you were probably a marked man before you even got over the border. Yes, I probably was. Well, only the same as with any other stranger. They mean no harm. Just the old curiosity, I suppose. They haven't enough to fill their own lives with. So they have a very bad habit of spilling over into other people's. Oh, huh? sorry. I didn't mean to go on. Be spouting from Bethesda pulpit next. Just having someone to talk to again, I suppose. Well, you've always had Cass. Oh, yes, I've always had Cass. Oh, that coffee must be cold. Let me hot you up. There. There. Are you warm enough? <laughs> Stop cosseting. Not in a draft, are you? No, uh, uh, don't close the door. If they call down, we may not hear. Oh, I suppose you're right, yes. But it's funny not to hear that old stick of his hammering away up there all hours of the day and night. Stick? 
His way of letting us know he was needing something, you see. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. And any minute expecting to have him down on top of us. Four posted and all. <laughs> all ours. It's no wonder you both look so done in. Now, why on earth didn't you have that nurse from the word go? Oh, easily said, my boy. We tried, of course. Might as well have saved our breath for the amount of good it did. Strangers, you see. Mm -hmm. Didn't want them about the place. Rummaging through the drawers and breathing his air and pinching his small change off the bedside table. <laughs> oh. But then, you know what the old mule can be like when he sticks his heels in about something? Ah, uh, yes. She went on about you, I guessed him, right to the end. My mum? Dada wouldn't let her so much as mention your name. But she went on about you all the same. We, we thought you'd write. Well, Mum and I did anyway. Used to take it in turns to get up early and go through the posts before the others came down. We did it for a long time. Then we stopped. What good could it have done? Or the way things were between... Exactly. What good could it have done? Sleeping dogs lie and count your blessings. Cass always said that. Cass always said. Well? Well, indeed, yes. What good? And time passes. And eventually, well, it all gets to seeming unimportant. To you, too. To you? Something to be viewed calmly. To talk about. Like we're talking about it now. So it all really happened to somebody else. And sometimes I can nearly fool myself that it did. But then there are others, particularly when I'm sitting down here alone at night, listening to the tick of that old clock, when I've got to face up to the fact that it wasn't somebody else at all. It was to you, Sarah Roberts. The choice was yours, and you made it. And now you must pay the price for every day of your life. You must pay. The price? This. All of this. Like a bad habit you couldn't break yourself of. You know, I never forget the day when you left. Escape, you called it. But I couldn't honestly understand what it was you thought you was escaping from. Well, not this, surely. A good home. A respectable home. It wasn't until much later I understood the narrowness of it all. I, I even tried to do something about it. Huh? I answered an advertisement in the Gazette. Oh, pathetic, isn't it? Is it? Oh, I can't really remember what it was for now. The only important thing at the time was that it would take me away from home. Bookkeeping or maybe a ledger clerk of some kind, I suppose. I know you had to apply in your best copper plate. And I've always been pretty good at that. What happened, Sarah? I had my hand on the front door when Cass called out from the back. Wash day of all things. And would I give a hand with a mangle? And without even thinking about it, I put the case down and went. Just habit, you see. And she never even asked why I was got up like a dog's dinner. Well, and there was no point trying to explain. Because she already knew. Had known all along. And when we'd finished, the case was back in its old place on top of the wardrobe. And the birthday cards and the ribbons and the photographs all put neatly back in their drawers. It was never mentioned again. Hardly even thought about. Till now. Well, Quite a little coincidence, don't you think? Cass, well, how long have you... Long enough. More than enough. Well, don't look so sheepish, yes, Dinbach. You ought to be congratulating yourself. Not 24 hours back in the hive and you've got the old bees buzzing oh, already. Yes. Oh, yes. Quite the little rebel, Rosa. The old order changeth, giving place to new. Is that it? Up with the barricades, is it? But you might have picked on somebody your own size or our conscripts coming smaller this year. But I don't know what you're talking about. You know damn well what. And don't think you can fool me with that butter wouldn't melt in my mouth look. This is what you've been working for ever since you left and slammed that front door behind you. What have I been working for, Cass? Hedging the bets, don't they call it? Playing it both ways. 
You know very well Dad isn't going to let you come into anything on your own account, so you reckon you can cut your losses by getting round our Sarah. Gosh. Not while I'm around to stop you, you won't. Oh, I don't know how. No, you... no, no, you don't. Because as far as Justin Bach is concerned, you've never been able to see further than your nose. Why do you think your blue-eyed boy left in the first place, Sarah? Out of consideration for us? Justin had his own life to leave. Oh, yeah, he had that, he had that. And he grabbed the chance with both hands, knowing damned well that we'd always be stuck keeping the home fires burning. But what about our lives? Do you think there's ever been a single moment in all these years, Sarah, when he stopped to give a thought to that? He gave me no choice, Cass. Oh, none. You made good and sure of that. No choice. Because you deliberately drove him to the point where he had none. But walking out... Didn't do anything for us, did it, Justin? You know, I used to spend hours picturing you tucked away in some little bed sitter somewhere. Like here, was it? Keep out sign on the door, and our man forever whispering, don't knock, he might be working. <laughs> Perhaps it's her I should blame. One little scholarship, local boy makes good, and nothing's too good for our guest. Aye, she never saw till it was too late what a stranger it was turning you into. I had no quarrel with ma'am. Didn't stop you leaving. There was no love lost between oh, us. Oh, that's big of you. Well, why should there have been? She treated you like a prize bull in a cow pen. The love, it, it poured out of her. Even when she was doing something as daft and ordinary as ironing your shirt tails. <laughs> no, boyo, you weren't easy to replace. Not even he could manage it completely. Whatever he tried to make you think. That uh, room of yours. Have you been in it since you got back? No. Well, it's just the same as on the day you left. But not our ma'am's orders. His. I have to laugh every time I dust the place. <laughs> I have to. Regular little museum piece. Even do the guided tour if you could ever find anybody interested enough. Go on. Ah, he's up there by the hour. Learn to handle those books as though he really knows what's between the covers. He might even swat up the odd title to impress the boys at the next Rotary Dad meeting. Dad can look after himself. All right. Maybe he can and maybe he can't. But there were others. What about Sarah here? Cass. What did you do to her? And what are you still doing? Cass. Poor, simple-minded Sarah. After all these years, she's still going on about being thwarted. And from what? That's what I'd like to know, Justin. I'd really like to. At least when you left, you, you you had yourself to fall back on. Something that people could recognise as you. And even if they didn't or wouldn't, you could always climb back on your pedestal and pretend you were above it all. But what about her? No, Cass. All right, all right, all right. Go on, answer. Answer for yourself on your own two oh, feet. please. But it's what we've been going on about, isn't it? If I hadn't called you back that day, if you had left as you planned... Do you honestly think you'd have lasted five minutes? I don't know. Cass. No, no. You don't, but I do. Because I've had to know, Sarah, for both of us for the past 20 years. I, I know what you're capable of and what you're not. I know the difference between you against yourself and you against the world. And you, Cass? We seem to have covered everybody but you. I know what I know. One thing. I know him up there better than our mum and better than any of you. I accept him for what he is, for where he's come from and where he's got to. And maybe I've even got an inkling about what it's cost him to get there. You know? Yes. And it doesn't make me feel angry or cheated or better or worse just that bit wiser older and wiser I'm sorry oh, yes doctor he's asking for you oh yes of course sir. Uh, no uh, yes Tim. he particularly said just yes Tim. Father? Mm. Oh, you. So you finally decided to get here, did you? Uh, last night. I looked in from time to time, but... Well, anyway, how are you feeling now? Feeling, feeling. How the devil do you think I'm feeling? 
<laughs> get out, woman. Damn you, get out. Take your starch where it's appreciated. Yes, thank you, nurse. Yes, then, uh, not too long. I'll be just outside. Well, what was all that about? All what? The rumpus, boy. All that rumpus from downstairs just now. <laughs> you needn't look so sheepish. I'm a bit past giving you six on the backside. I'm glad to hear it. Not that it would take much to guess. Our car sat it again, I suppose. A premature division of the spoils, is that it? Serving the fatted calf to you may be one thing, but topping the goose that lays the golden egg. Out of the question. Are you ever going to sit down? Or is it all set for the quick getaway? I'm in no hurry. It wasn't you I was thinking of. Not so far away, boy. In the light. But I can see you. You thinner? No fatter. Always was like a rake. Always. Bean sticks in trousers. No spunk. You now Cass could give you better than she got. <laughs> you now Cass. Just built that way. Used to tell her that. Ma'am? Just the way he's built, I used to tell her. Fat lot of good. Wouldn't take my word. Doctors, specialists, quacks. Nothing would do, nothing. Still, you've seen us out, all right? You've seen us out? <laughs> you got rid of that ridiculous beard, then? <laughs> that beard. <laughs> I've got rid of a lot of things. Everything except the chip, eh? Oh, you don't have to answer that one. Can tell it from here, just by looking at you. Just from the way you perched yourself on the edge of that chair. Tetchy as some old ram tethered to its thicket. Still carrying his blessed cross to Calvary. Except that the cross is proving a bit heavier, the gradient a bit steeper than anything he ever imagined. No, look, I... Oh, I know. I know. One word more, is it? One word more and I'll be the other side of that door so fast the old devil won't even be able to manage a dying curse. I know. You... You shouldn't talk like that. And you shouldn't be so touchy. It's an old man's prerogative. You'll come to it soon enough. But it's not turning out as bad as you thought, is it? Not now you're here. Not now it's happening. I, I... Me being vulnerable. That's what you was most afraid of. Especially after last night. It's still there in your eye. The last feeble curses of the dying tyrant. That's what you expected. And you'd have had no answer to that. Just a vague feeling of something between pity and disgust. Oh, you needn't bother to lie. If I'd been in your boots, it's what I would have expected. Matter of fact, after last night's little do, I'm even surprising myself. It's the mind, I suppose. All in the mind. Or maybe just the old habit. Well, when you've been on top all your life, the fact that you're about to peg it shouldn't make no difference, should it? No difference. And that's why you can sit there and take it, you see. You can take it. Because I can take it. And because... <laughs> oh, easy now. Easy. Here. Go on. Drink. All right, I'm all right. Look, don't you think you ought to rest a bit? And have you wasted the train fare? That would never do. Besides, God knows it's been hard enough keeping tracks of you all these years. How did you? You had to eat. Even the bloody martyr has to eat. From the things you said before you slammed out, I reckoned you'd had enough of the so-called business world for the time being. The only other thing you could fall back on was that fiddling teacher's diploma. <laughs> God knows you threatened us with it enough. From then on, it was simple. I, I, I had thought about going abroad. Rangoon or Reading, eh? Still, knowing you, I'd have been a fool not to kick off with Reading. I suppose so. Married 18 months after you left. Son the following year, Russell Anthony. It would have been nice if you'd named him after me. You really did your homework. Just bloody mindedness, of course. But I'd like to have seen him. Was thinking about it. 
If you'd got the custody when she walked Nobody out... Nobody walked out. Might even have got round to seeing him all right. But why pass it on to a load of strangers? Why, indeed? Why didn't it work out? Mind your own damn business. If you had the time and I had the inclination, I'd be happy to let you into the grisly details. Maybe I was too young. Maybe it was a mistake to leave one bear garden only to set up another. Then why did you go? Oh, there was a fat lot of choice, wasn't there? It takes two. To make a quarrel. So that's the current get-out, is it? Beautiful. I must get it embroidered for you for Christmas and we can hang it above the bed along with God is love and repenty for the kingdom. I doubt if I'd be around to appreciate oh, it. And you can cut out the sob sister routine too because I don't give a cuss whether you're around or not. You hear? I gave up feeling anything as positive years ago. I see. All right. I'm sorry, damn you. I'm sorry. Can I open the window? It's as hot as hell in here. But you still haven't answered my question. Why? You've got to be joking. Oh, not the obvious reasons. The not getting on, the quarrels, the fights, the threats. Because in a way, they're only what old Marsh would call the symptoms, aren't they? It's the cause. The thing inside you I've never been able to understand. Even when I tried. And you needn't smile because I did. Believe it or not, at first I did. Ah, yes. At first, in the beginning, probably the most beguiling words in the language, beguiling, full of promise, and as doom-ridden as old boots. Because the simple fact of the matter is simply wanting things to work out, even making allowances, wanting to get on with people, isn't always enough, is it? Oh, you weren't the only one. I found that out since with... Well, let's just say I found it out. The grisly details. Exactly. So what are you left with now? Don't ask me. I'm still trying to find out. But all those years you must have been looking in a particular direction. Not that particular, and more groping than looking. I'd still like to know. Just what I am. Myself, I suppose. It's all really there from the start. A at the start. In the beginning, as you say. The hard bit is getting it back. Getting it uncluttered, out in the open again. Too damned airy fairy to my way of thinking. Maybe that's why I never cottoned on to you. <laughs> the generation gap. Nothing is fancy. Let's just say I've always been too damn busy trying to fill my stomach to wonder where the crust came from, or whether I was entitled to it, or if there was a more deserving cause. Oh, God. I know. Pathetic, isn't it? Get it down, you boy, before somebody bigger and stronger comes and takes it away. Pathetic. There were reasons. My father and both my brothers had died of the dust by the time I was 14. Cement spitters, they used to call them. Comic, isn't it? Comic. But I still can't put a coal on the fire without thinking how bloody unnecessary it was. There were two sisters, too. Both died in childhood before they were old enough to get their bonnets through the door. My mother bled to death over the last one. Maybe just to keep her company. Or maybe because we couldn't afford the doctor's fees. And they weren't even giving hemorrhages on tick. I'm sorry. But why should you be? Anyway, if it hadn't been for your great gran. She had a wheel across her forehead an inch wide and nearly as deep. From carrying the coal hodge duty. No cages in a day. Just a rope ladder. Straight down the shaft. And this coal basket strapped by a leather thong across the forehead. Forty to fifty trips a shift they made, more if they could. Because the more climbs they got through, the more chance of keeping their babies' bellies full. Oh, they really tried. Some tried so hard they overloaded the hod. And then forgot all about holding on. It used to hold things up a bit. But the owners didn't complain too much. I mean, there was always another eager mother to take her place, and the hods were well nigh indestructible. Why are you telling me all this? I don't know. To explain myself to you, I suppose, to try to. Because I've got my scars to see, and all this, the way things look, 
Don't make a hapence of a difference. There's no inch deep wheel across my forehead. Nothing as simple. Because by the time I was old enough to start, things had improved. The kids were still down in the dark, but the rope ladder had gone. And most of the mothers were dying either in childbirth or from malnutrition. We'd come a long way. But the scars there, all right, still there. And if you think all your faldy dark Christian socialism and love thy neighbour bit means damn all to me, lad, you got another. <coughs> damn all, I say. Damn all. I'd, I'd better call them. Not yet. No, no, not yet. Something. Something for you to do. Sympathy. Thank you. Sympathy. Thank you. Condolences. Thank you. Condolences. Thank you. Sympathy and condolences. Thank you. Sympathy and condolences. Thank you. Very much. A single to Reading, please. What? A single to Reading. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now then, what was it you was wanting? Oh, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sure. Well, uh, it, it is Mr. Roberts, isn't it? Yes. Mr. Yestin Roberts, son of Mr. Mostin Roberts? Yes. Of course, of course. I was wondering... Oh, I'm very sorry to hear, I'm sure. I'm sure we all were. Still in the midst of, uh, as the saying goes. Thank you. Fine man, your father. Fine. I was wondering... Not that I really knew the gentleman, of course. Well, not really to say that I knew him, if you see what I mean. But a bit of respect costs nothing. That's what I always say. I always say that... My ticket. What? Oh, aye. Oh, ticket. Yes. It was red then, you said? Uh, yes. Return, of course. Uh, no, just the one way. Ah, just a... Uh, one way to red in? The waiting room is open, is it? Waiting room? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, not any fire there, though. Not much called, you see. Still, you've got a bit of time to kill, too, so seeing as how you're still in your anguish and all, and but uh, dead against the rules, of course, why don't you come in? The waiting I... room will be fine. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Very bloody much, sir. Help poor sailors on a night like this. Dr. Marsh, making your rounds? Just passing, boy, just passing. On the other hand, and for what it's worth, if you don't shift out of that draft, you'll have me thinking we might have fixed up two funerals for the price of one. I tried everywhere else. And? Uh, heads they win. Tails you lose. Tell you what, you've still got a fair bit of time before the downline's answer to the Flying Scot roars in. Why don't we pop across to the railway tavern and... give the locals the pleasure of seeing a principal mourner knocking it back before the turf had time to settle? Mm, probably uh... right. <laughs> oh, well, just have to make do with a bit of do-it-yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, should be a flask here somewhere. Mm. Eureka! Drop of the old local anaesthetic. Oh, uh, no thanks. Sli I... Sip up, boy. You can write it off as doctor's orders. Thanks. <coughs> Perfect Ooh. graveside comforter. No respectable mourner would be found dead without it. <laughs> Trick is not to get too near the edge. Remember once it... Still, uh, it's another story. Now, move up a bit then. Yes. It went well. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Very well. Like you say. We missed you. At the graveside. I left uh, right after the service. I never did go much for the earth scattering bit. It makes such an obscene clatter, don't you think? Then, of course, it's probably meant to. Mm. 
took it for granted I'd see you back at the house. <laughs> Plate of ham, pineapple chunks, and who gets the grandfather clock? No, not much in my line either. <laughs> A point taken. Never fails to amaze me how quickly the prayers for the dead are replaced by the demands of the living. A house of sorrow to Ali Baba's cave in the twinkling of a gravedigger's shovel. Still, I... Are you were about to say? Well, only that I should have thought in this case. This case? What particular case is that? You uh, were the only male heir. Oh, the give and bequeath bit. Long faces, port wine, and cross fingers under the plush tablecloth, hmm? There was quite a bit in the kitty. And me without a card in my hand. Come off you, Doctor. You've got to be joking. Have I? But, <laughs> oh, you of all people should have known how he felt on that score. I know how he used to feel. What? Change of heart, perhaps? <laughs> <But> why not? <laughs> because he had no heart, that's why not. The only thing that kept him going this long was the idea that by kicking the bucket, he might be doing somebody else a favor. Oh, look, I, I'm not griping. I think the girls deserve every penny they get. They hoped you'd see it like that. Hoped? But, well, they must have known they were coming into everything. I mean, it was all signed and sealed. Oh, it was. Oh? Uh, what's that supposed to mean? You were with him alone. So? For a long time. So? So, let's face it, he was more than capable of producing a joker from up his sleeve right till the very last minute. Another will. Revoking everything that had gone before. And just the thing to set the angels laughing. Exactly. Well? Like you say, he was capable. On top of which there was the little matter of the Bureau. Bureau? Mostyn's Bureau, his private Bureau. So private, in fact, he even had it moved into the bedroom so that he could keep an eye on it. It was as much as anybody dared to put a duster on it. The keys never left him. Not even during his illness. Always locked. Which is exactly the way it was when I left you together. Your move. Stupid of me. I should have returned the key before calling. I suppose I was still hoping you hadn't noticed. <laughs> Whatever gave you the impression I had. You mean... <sighs> Your talents are wasted, Doctor. We try. All right, there was something. Just before the end, something he wanted me to... to take care of. Oh, not what you're thinking, no revoking, no last-minute upsets about where the lolly was going, so you could have saved yourself the trouble. You did say there was... something. The other half, I suppose you might call it. You got the will. I got the testament bit. Testament? Isn't that what they call it? The bit that happens after all the worldly goods have been disposed of. Sort of declaration of intent. They used to go in for it quite a bit in the old days, along with the deathbed blessing, or curse, as the case may be. It's just out of interest I looked it up. Testament. A statement of proof or confirmation. That's what it said. And that's just about what it amounted to. Confirmation? Of what? Of what I'd known him for right from the start. The real Mostyn. The thing that lurked behind the facade of respectability, the sham, the trappings. All there, in his own fair hand. Black on white. The skullduggery, the crookery, the double dealings. The things that really made him tick. More than a testament. A regular book of revelations. Names, dates, places. People he'd conned, people he'd persuaded, people who'd simply jumped the same bandwagon because of what they could get out of it. But why would he want to... Tell me, of all people? Oh, not the confession is good for the soul routine, if that's what you're thinking. But it's not too difficult to understand, is it? The ship is sinking, so at least let's seal the portholes so the rats can't escape. Well, somebody had to inherit the job. Who better? He probably saw me as some latter-day Pied Piper, only too happy to tootle the flute he'd so thoughtfully put at my disposal. A gigantic purge to rid the community of vermin. So tootle your flute, Piper, and sweep the hypocrisy and cant right back into the sewer where it belongs. All courtesy of Councillor Mostyn William Roberts. OBE. But isn't that what you've always wanted? I'd always thought so. It was certainly what he gambled on. 
was certainly why I left. And now? I don't know. Maybe I've changed. Or maybe the lamb cried in the wilderness so long it lost its voice. Or maybe... Yes? Maybe confirmation, when it comes, turns out to be just the teeniest, weeniest bit of an anticlimax. Where is this document now? Hmm? <laughs> ah, you needn't look so anxious, Doctor. No delayed revelations, not even the odd spot of blackmail on the side. Where? He still has it. I don't follow what you mean. I gave it back. Just before they screwed the lid down. A final moment of parting. What could be simpler? Besides, he was always a great one for carrying his credentials. Hmm? <laughs> no. It's funny to think of all those po-faced bigwigs at the graveside with a veritable Vesuvius under their feet. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, give me a hand with the cases, will you? be opening the new hospital wing in a couple of weeks. So you were saying? Uh, there's to be a bust. In the entrance hall. Ah, he'd have liked that. Not much like him. The fact is, they farmed it out to some relative of one of the governors. Nephew, I think. Too much hair. A sort of cross between Lloyd George and Dr. Schweitzer. He'd have liked that even better. Yes, Tim. What shall I tell Cass? You'll think of something. Besides, do you honestly think it would make any difference? to the unveiling, the minister referred to the deceased as not only a man of generosity and vision, but a shining light whose untimely passing made the community he'd, he'd loved a darker place in which to live. Among those present at the ceremony were Councillor and Mrs. J.R. Davis, Councillor and Mr. place Th in which to live. Did you say something, Cass? No, just thinking. A councillor and Mrs. T. Lewis, councillor and Mrs. Peter Hearn, councillor and Mrs. W. S. Jones, chairman of the board of governors, H. P. Wilkins and Mrs. Wilkins, chairman of the finance committee, P. R. Roberts, chairman of the Mostyn Roberts Appeal Fund, Mrs. W. O. Abrams, secretary of the Mostyn Roberts Appeal Fund. Jesus bids us shine with a clear, pure light. Like a little candle burning in the night In this world of darkness we must shine You in your smoke corner and I in mine That was Stranger at the Gate by William Ingram Dr. Marsh was played by Windsor Davis. Mostyn Roberts by Meredith Edwards. His daughters, Sarah and Cass, by Christine Pollan and Elizabeth Morgan. And his son, Yestin, by William Ingram. Production was by Betty Davis. <laughs>